Joseph Paul Franklin was a complicated guy. He was smart enough to escape from an interrogation room after being arrested for a double murder in Utah, smart enough to continually avoid capture or even identification for up to 21 murders committed across 11 states over three years. He continually changed identities, carefully planned numerous attacks, and once even escaped from authorities at the courthouse while he was on trial by quickly MacGyvering his way into a locked elevator. And yet, he was also dumb and delusional enough to think he could single-handedly spark a race war, similar to the apocalyptic and insane helter-skelter scenario envisioned by Charles Manson. Franklin was an American serial killer convicted of murdering eight people in five different states during a three-year murder spree that took place between 1977 and 1980. Franklin targeted Jewish people, black people, interracial couples, and young white women who he found out had previously dated black men. Yeah, he was that racist. He also shot a black civil rights leader for being publicly seen with white women, a white porn mag publisher who dared to publish a sexual pictorial of a black man and a white woman together, and two black children who were just walking to the store to buy some candy. Joseph Franklin typically killed his victims in sniper-style shootings, hiding out in a concealed spot, shooting victims from a distance where they could not see their deaths coming. He was inspired by terrible people like Adolf Hitler and Charles Manson, and deplorable hate groups like the KKK and the American Nazi Party. He became interested in white supremacist ideologies when he was a confused and angry teenager looking for a group to belong to and a cause to believe in. He would leave every white supremacist group he joined. They were never serious enough about their racial hate for his liking. Joseph Paul Franklin was the rare white supremacist who disturbed most other white supremacists by essentially being too racist. He didn't want to just sit around and talk about how, how much he hated non-whites. He wanted to take action against them, deadly action. He committed his first known racially motivated attack in September of 1976 when he sprayed an interracial couple with mace. Just a year later, 1977, he began his series of cross-country murders, funding his violent crimes mainly through bank robberies and paid blood bank donations. His final arrest kicked off a series of numerous trials across several states and led to a huge battle between the Missouri State Department of Corrections, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the European Union when it came to which drug could and would be used to lethally inject him. This week, we discuss the life and crimes of Joseph Paul Franklin, looking into how he went from a lonely, abused boy into a still lonely, hate-filled killer in a true crime, serial killer, race is just an illusion. And we are all on the same human meat sack team, whether we want to accept that or not, edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, once again, and welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, Sir Sucks a Lot, Blood Atonement Arbiter, Possible Son of Perdition, and you are definitely listening to Time Suck. Uh, still not quite ready to discuss the recent controversial episode about one of the most heinous serial killers I've ever heard of, Richard Byrd, Las Vegas Strip Strangler. Be sure and check that out if you haven't already. Like I said last episode, wow, just, uh, just Wow. Whew. Uh, and that's it. No announcements. Uh, we're just going to hop on the wild ride that was the chaotic life of Joseph Paul Franklin. Today, going to lay this out by beginning with a brief introduction of Joseph Paul Franklin and his racist beliefs, which were the primary motivation for his murder spree. Then jumping into the timeline, we'll try and understand how the hell he became the monster he became by examining uh, his timeline, which, as you are probably assuming, was uh, far from ideal, uh, didn't have the best childhood. And the timeline will continue until he is eventually executed by the state of Missouri after a very prolonged battle between the government, uh, prisoner advocacy groups, international pharmaceutical companies, and even the European Union. Interesting insight into how complicated carrying out a death penalty can be in modern times. So here we go. Uh, Joseph Paul Franklin was, uh, you know, a supreme being. Superhuman, uh, smarter, stronger, handsomer, talented -er than most of us could ever hope to aspire to be, thanks to superior uh, Aryan genetics. He was one of the select members of the master race, a demigod walking amongst us mere mud blood mortals. Or, either that or, 
He was a mentally ill victim of extreme abuse as a child who wanted to finally feel superior because he had long felt so inferior. And when he was introduced to, uh, you know, white supremacist ideology, it spoke to him. It allowed him to embrace a bunch of twisted, fabricated victim mentality bullshit. Some, uh, you've only been labeled a loser and feel like a loser because uh, your white birthright was stripped from you by a leftist, anti-white, pro-inferior race agenda bullshit. And it made him feel strong. Made him feel like a hero in his life story instead of as a, a victim or villain. Made him feel like he was an important revolutionary. Instead of what was the truth, uh, he was a cold-blooded killer of innocent men, women, and children who were only guilty of being born from a lineage not as European-centric as his own. He was a monster. At the age of 27, this confused and delusional mess of a delusional mess of a meat sack, this man with a dangerous hornet's nest of a mind, began a series of murders that lasted from 1977 to 1980. He killed at least 15 people in 11 states, according to the FBI, more likely 21. Uh, Joseph Paul Franklin truly was so confused about who he was. He even changed his name thanks to struggles with his identity. He was not born Joseph Paul Franklin. He was actually born James Clayton Vaughn Jr. He would later change his name to show his admiration for... Not a combo I expected. I don't think this is a combo anyone would expect. Benjamin Franklin and uh, Nazi leader Joseph Goebbels. Okay. Uh, weird for a racist. Uh, was Benjamin Franklin racist? Well, he was a white dude, born in Boston in 1706. So, you know, yeah. However, he evolved greatly over the course of his life. This founding father of America, while he owned slaves as a young man, spoke out against the practice of slavery later in his life, which was not typical for those times. Uh, Joseph must have uh, not been a great student in history. Guessing he wasn't familiar with Benjamin Franklin's connection to the Williamsburg Bray School in Williamsburg, Virginia. It was a school for both free and enslaved black children founded in 1760 and opened at Franklin's suggestion. And it was open because previously Benjamin's wife, Deborah, had encouraged her husband to visit a new school for enslaved and free black children in Philadelphia. And after his visit, Franklin admitted that while he had previously held a low opinion of the, quote, natural capacities of the black race, uh, upon observing the children at school, it had proven his prejudices wrong. He now knew that they were, quote, in every respect equal to that of white children. In every respect. Once he challenged his ignorant prejudices with some empirical observation, as an intelligent man, he realized the error of his ways. That guy, not a good counterpart for Joseph Goebbels. Goebbels was one of Hitler's closest, most rabid, devoted followers. Uh, he was the Reich Minister of Propaganda from 1933 all the way until his death in 1945. He never evolved, uh, held deeply rooted racist beliefs. No one pushed harder for the Holocaust, for the final solution than that guy. He was so racist that the day after Hitler killed himself in his bunker, Goebbels and his wife also took their own lives right after he conspired to poison all six of their kids because he would rather see them dead than live in a world where Jews and other minorities were treated as equals. So again, the pairing of Benjamin Franklin and Joseph Goebbels uh, that makes very little sense. But are we really surprised that a white supremacist who went on a killing spree to start a race war uh, would make uh, choices that were not logical? This guy's entire adult life was one illogical choice followed by another. Joseph Franklin was first drawn to white supremacist groups when he was a teenager, started associating with white supremacist groups and became increasingly confrontational towards minorities in his teens, according to the FBI, who also writes on their website, by the mid-70s, he had rejected even the most radical hate groups because he didn't think they took their hatred far enough. He wanted to attack, not just sit around complaining. His self-directed mission, he later suggested, was to incite his fellow supremacists to action. That's fucking crazy <laughs> to be at a KKK meeting and be frustrated that they're not racist enough. Come on, guys. Fuck are we doing? Are we going to go to war? Or are we just going to sit around and wear funny hats? Only thing you fuckers seem interested in is lynching is grocery store donuts, cheap coffee. And another thing before I leave, some of you fuckers need to stay out of the sun a lot more than you've been doing. Do you want to be white? Or do you want to look like uh, the Mexicans and Italians and shit? We're supposed to, uh, you know, uh, be, be hating. Surprised you fuckers uh, don't want to hold meetings at some goddamn Taco Tuesday. Yeah, Franklin didn't want to talk. He wanted to do. He wanted to start a race war by targeting Jewish people, black people, or people in interracial relationships. At least that's what he claimed. Southern Poverty Law Center writes, although he didn't use the term, his crimes were what other racists would come to call acts of Phineas priests. Um, yeah, Phineas priests based on the Bible story describing Phineas killing of a man and a woman of different tribes who were having sex. Many white supremacists see this story as proof that God approves of murdering race mixers. 
Uh, Franklin's racially motivated crimes would attract the attention of the FBI. He was the, uh, one of the first serial killers caught in part thanks to some new procedures they were developing. A little bit. Uh, they, they definitely uh, worked on some stuff with him. I don't know how much it really helped, helped a little bit. Uh, FBI decided to use a, a new approach of criminal profiling to try and capture Franklin at the very end. Uh, the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit had been created in 1972. The BSU began profiling serial killers in 1976. Douglas's three-year murder spree began in 1977. And the FBI's new behavioral analysts or analysts profiled Joseph Paul Franklin and shared their profile with law enforcement and the public. Again, at the very end, like in the last few weeks when he was on the loose. Uh, there were two important details they made public. A description of Joseph's tattoos and a habit of going to blood donation banks to make a little extra uh, money to fuel his crimes. Uh, former FBI Unit Chief John Douglas and his partner, Agent Bob Ressler, pioneered the behavioral research program. We talked about that in the BSU suck a while back. Uh, within the FBI with the help of Dr. Ann Burgess, who is currently still a professor at Boston College at the age of 87 years young. Uh, they began compiling a database of information about serial offenders. They interviewed serial killers like Ed Kemper and mentally disturbed killers who also thought they were important, uh, a mentally disturbed killer uh, who also thought they were uh, important players, excuse me, in the impending race war like Charles Manson to understand the minds of these killers, what motivates them and thus how to catch them. Douglas wrote about how the FBI profiled Franklin in his book, The Killer's Shadow, The FBI's Hunt for a White Supremacist Killer, published in 2020. Douglas wrote that this case marked a turning point where the FBI started to consider the interview program as a tool that could help them identify suspects. Douglas said, Most of my cases were unsub cases, unknown subject cases. Now here is a known person who just escaped from prison and no one knows where he is in the United States. So is there anything that I've learned from these other cases that I was working and doing interviews with that I could possibly apply to this case? Douglas predicted that Joseph Franklin would go back to areas he felt uh, familiar with, like Mobile, Mobile, Alabama, and Franklin was seen in Mobile shortly before he was captured in, down in Florida. A few weeks later, uh, a blood bank operator in uh, Florida, after he was in Mobile, contacted the FBI because he had seen a man matching the description they suggested sending out. Following his arrest, Franklin was transported across the country for the next two decades face murder charges in multiple states he would be convicted at both the state and federal levels regarding what he learned about franklin's motives john douglas said the victim could have been anyone well uh, kind of he targeted interracial couples jewish people black people just his attitude alone was disturbing many of the murderers i've interviewed there's usually a sexual bent to their crimes sometimes they'll show emotion even if it's bullshit but he was a different animal i was hoping for a faint glimmer of remorse instead he was always bragging boasting even trying to educate us on how he planned all his crimes now, he was real proud of himself. Uh, about to jump into the timeline now. Before I do, real quick, I found it interesting that this dude was so racist. Uh, <laughs> uh, even the white supremacy community in America was divided over whether or not this guy was a hero, a brave martyr for their cause, or a lunatic who took shit too far. <laughs> Again, a dude so racist, he made other white supremacists cringe. I didn't think that was possible. After Franklin's execution, there was an intense debate on Stormfront.org, a popular white nationalist web forum launched in 1996 described as a neo-Nazi internet forum and the web's first major racial hate site. Stormfront Forum acts as one of the largest online gatherings of racism uh, for racism and Holocaust denial in the world, uh, with threads on this theme getting hundreds of thousands of views. And Stormfront was founded by Don Black, former Alabama KKK leader, man so racist the UK banned him in 2009 from ever entering their country again. He once told an Italian journalist in 2008 that Stormfront was the new KKK. And this guy... Wrote about Joseph Paul Franklin saying, I've been contemplating how my life would have been different had he remained the only white nationalist I'd ever met. I'd have quit in disgust. <laughs> ah, Franklin was too extreme, too racist for a guy not allowed to visit the UK ever, specifically for the racist views he uh, espouses. Most other white nationalists seem to uh, love him, though. And still do William Pierce, who founded the National Alliance, a neo-Nazi organization in 1974 and would lead it until his death in 2002, uh, greatly admired Joseph Paul Franklin. Southern Poverty Law Center, or SPLC, wrote that the National Alliance was for decades the most dangerous and best organized neo-Nazi formation in America. Explicitly genocidal in its ideology, any materials call for the eradication of the Jews and other races and the creation of an all-white homeland. Pierce attempted to immortalize Franklin by dedicating his 1989 novel Hunter to him. William Pierce wrote his, in his dedication in Hunter, dedica dedicated to Joseph Paul Franklin, the lone hunter who saw his duty as a white man and did what a responsible son of his race must do to the best of his ability and without regard for the personal consequences. 
my God, acting like what this dude did dude was uh, righteous, just responsible. It's fucking outrageous. William Pierce never did any of this shit. Uh, both William Pierce and Don Black, by the way, uh, had children who would both grow up to hate and speak out against them. Pierce's, son's Kel- uh, Pierce's son, Kelvin, co-authored a book published in 2020 called Sins of My Father, Growing Up with America's Most Dangerous White Supremacist. Uh, apparently, in addition to being a racial hate monger, Pierce was a woman beater. Kelvin said he was emotionally and physically abusive to his mom, the first of his five wives. The last three of his wives were all male order brides from Hungary. The first two left him for being such an asshole. And the last one who stayed with him the last five years of his miserable life reported being miserable living with him the entire time and only stayed to get her citizenship. He doesn't, he doesn't sound too supreme. These supremacists never do. Uh, Pierce wrote his uh, novel Hunter under the pseudonym Andrew McDonald. And Hunter depicts a serial killer similar to Joseph Paul Franklin, who targets government officials and interracial couples. Uh, we've talked about Pierce before. He's also the guy who wrote the Turner Diaries, published 1978, also under the pseudonym Andrew McDonald. That book depicts a violent revolution in the U.S., which led to the overthrow uh, or leads to the overthrow of the federal government, a nuclear war, and ultimately a race war, which leads to the systematic extermination of non-whites and Jews. All groups opposed by the novel's protagonist, Earl Turner, including Jews, non-white people, liberal actors, and politicians, are murdered in mass. The Turner Diaries was described when it came out as being explicitly racist and anti-Semitic by the New York Times and has been labeled the Bible of the Racist Right by the FBI. That shitty book has been very influential in shaping recent decades of white nationalism and the later development of the white genocide conspiracy theory that claims a, a secret global Jewish cabal you know, have been puppet masters pulling the strings on an in-progress genocide of us whites. Through forced assimilation, we're being brainwashed into having sex with so many sexy non-white Taylor Safina. They're so fucking hot. I mean, horrible. And our race, which is not really a race at all, just a skin color that many races share, is being eradicated through mass immigration that will eventually lead to a true violent genocide. Uh, This book has inspired numerous hate crimes and acts of terrorism, including the 1984 assassination of a Jewish radio host out of Denver, uh, Alan Berg, who openly mocked white nationalists, The 1995 Oklahoma City bombing masterminded by former suck subject Timothy Noodle McDryween McVeigh and the 1999 London nail bombings that killed three people and injured 140, four of whom lost limbs. This one book is estimated to have greatly influenced perpetrators in over 200 murders. I'm sure Franklin was familiar with it. Likely read it during his murder spree, found it tremendously inspiring, I would guess. A reminder that he was uh, good and brave and righteous. And just like that hateful dumb fuck book continues to inspire ignorant, savage thugs like Franklin, now his story also inspires others. Still today, there are many people who believe that Joseph Paul Franklin was doing something good by targeting black people, Jewish people, and interracial couples. But there are still many who hold anti-Semitic beliefs, uh, other racist beliefs who do not approve of interracial relationships. With that primer complete and our narrative this week framed, let's get into the weeds. Try to understand how James Clayton Vaughn Jr. transformed into Joseph Paul Franklin in today's time suck of his life and crimes. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. James Clayton Vaughn Jr. was born on April 13th, 1950 in Mobile, Alabama. From the very beginning, he would be called Jimmy. Jimmy! And uh, Jimmy was the son of a World War II veteran who became a butcher, James Vaughn Sr. and Helen Rao who was most, freak, uh, most frequently worked as a waitress. His father will spend his final years in a psychiatric hospital in Biloxi, Mississippi. He suffered a head wound from enemy fire in Iwo Jima. Left him with convulsions, speech impediment, and the need to use a cane to walk. Helen was the daughter of Nazi-supporting German immigrants. After growing up, his mentally ill father would frequently beat his very racist mother uh, to the point of causing at least one miscarriage. And then his mom would beat the shit out of the kids. Jimmy grew up in a shitstorm. He also grew up very poor. When he was born, his family was living hand to mouth. Uh, we're living in a recently integrated, formerly white-only, low-income Alabama housing project directly across the street from a black nightclub. Cue a lot of racial tension. Uh, Jimmy will later claim that the family was so poor they often went hungry and he felt that malnourishment adversely affected both his physical and mental development. Jimmy was one of four kids. Age is not listed in sources, but Jimmy's described as having been second to the oldest. He had two sisters, Carolyn and Marilyn. Carolyn was the oldest child, and then he had a younger brother, Gordon Vaughn, and of course, Marilyn's his younger sister. James Sr. lost a job soon after Jimmy was born. Uh, as far as being a butcher, seemed to focus mostly on drinking after that, uh, drinking and, and beating uh, his wife. Carolyn said in a 1980 interview that their father was arrested many times for public drunkenness, became a severe alcoholic. 
who was sometimes home, often night, often not, excuse me, would leave the family for various lengths of time. They wouldn't know when he was going to return. Then he finally left for good when Jimmy was eight. Once dad was out of the house, sounds like Helen abused the kids more than ever. One family friend described Helen as a full-blooded German, a real strict perfectionist lady. I never saw her beat any of them, but they told me stories. A lot of the stories would focus on Jimmy. Jimmy, from what his sisters will later say, would take the brunt of the beatings. Jimmy's sisters recalled that he was a quiet boy who stayed close to home. He enjoyed drawing, music, was very interested in religion, didn't have a lot of friends, didn't play sports, uh, was uh, kind of so unmemorable as a kid that interviewed years later, his uh, old teachers wouldn't even remember him. His sister Carolyn said that her brother, before he dropped out of high school and uh, would leave home for good years later, developed a severe hatred for their mother. Jimmy would later elaborate on his mother's childhood and share some examples of abuse in an interview with the Chattanooga Times Free Press, an interview he gave not long before he was executed for his confessed crimes. He said, my mama was the one abusing me because she was abused by her own mother. She told her that Mort, uh, she told her that Mort used to beat her, told me, I think he meant to say. She called her Mort for some reason or another, her mother. She told us one time that Mort was beating her really bad and she was crying and yelling. And so Mort stuck a piece of cloth down in her mouth to stop her from yelling when she was beating her. And the cloth got stuck in her throat and she almost strangled. Her mother used to beat her and she was returning the favor on her own children. And she, for some reason, loved to beat her children. She would walk up behind you when you were eating and with a big hand slap, a big hand slap you in the face. It would almost knock me off the chair. She'd go, sit up there and eat that right. Like I was doing something wrong while I was sitting there eating breakfast in the morning. Kind of made you real nervous too. She was always yelling, you know. It seemed like she didn't want to give anybody a moment's peace. She didn't want anyone to relax at all around her. She always wanted to fight. Yeah, imagine he's, okay, let's take a, let's, let's say he's being honest here, not exaggerating because this is toward his, the end of his life when he's trying to get out of a death sentence. But imagine that's your mom. Just walking around, tossing out insults, fucking slapping you out of nowhere, just for funsies. Like you don't have to do anything wrong and you just get hit hard in the face. Why? Because mama's an angry human being. What a pile of shit. I hate bullies. And that's who child beaters are, right? Bullies. And, and I like it when they get a taste of their own medicine. Uh, she knew better. You know, getting beat like that, then dishing out on your kids. That's somehow worse to me than uh, doing that when you weren't beat as a kid. Right? I hate it when the, when the bully becomes the bully. Helen knew how it felt to be treated like that. Knew how scared she was, the physical and emotional pain. But she did it anyway. And apparently enjoyed it. If you, if you believe what he's saying there. Joseph would later tell the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, my mother was full-blooded German who was five foot nine with about 170 pounds. She could hit really hard with her hands. And she liked to beat us with her hands, slap us, hit us with switches or belts. One time she took a long stick, two and a half feet long, about two inches in diameter. I'd gone into the fridge and taken some milk out to pour into a dish for a cat I'd brought home. And when she found out, she took that stick and started hitting me as hard as she could. All the kids were punished physically and frequently. And like that sad old story, the man beating his wife, and then his wife beats the kids, and then the kids beat the dog, and then the dog beats the cat. How violence creates more violence. Some of the children, including Jimmy, would deal with their feelings of being powerless victims of abuse by feeling powerful abusing others. Carolyn said that both her brothers took pleasure in abusing cats, such as by hanging them by their tails from clotheslines. That's <laughs> so fucked up. Uh, Carolyn, from the sounds of a few interviews and uh, other sources, seems uh, to have raised her other siblings more than her mother or father did. When Jimmy was seven, he suffered a significant injury that made him lose most of his vision in his right eye. This would alter his life trajectory a bit. Counts differ on what caused the eye injury. One story is that Jimmy hurt his eye when he crashed a bike. Another story is he was injured when uh, playing with the BB gun with his little brother. Jimmy's eye injury seems to have been made significantly worse. At least uh, he believed it was made worse by his mom refusing to take him to a doctor after it happened. FBI profiler, author John Douglas will state, it only made him despise his mother more. He ends up dropping out of high school. He wants to become a police officer, but he can't. So he's feeling inadequate and is filled with rage, right? Because he can't become a police officer because of his eyesight. Uh, he then becomes gravitated towards extreme groups like the American Nazi Party and the Ku, Ku Klux Klan uh, before he decides that's not enough, wants to take matters into his own hands. That was the birth of a lone wolf. Okay, getting ahead of myself a bit with that quote though. Uh, back it up to when Jimmy was eight now, he and the family moved to Dayton, Ohio, then to New Orleans before they returned to Alabama. No real details about why they moved or where exactly they lived. Uh, because their childhood was so shitty, his older sister Carolyn would later write in a statement uh, seeking clemency for Joseph while he was on death row that their parents cussed at them, shouted at them, beat them, and knocked us around unmercifully. She wrote that they were psychologically damaged due to their upbringing. She wrote that their brother Gordon had been in and out of mental institutions his entire adult life. 
Carolyn added her sister Marilyn also struggled with mental illness. As for herself, she wrote, As mentally ill as my siblings are, I did not remain unscathed. I know that I have post-traumatic stress disorder. Just writing about our childhood has caused me an undue anguish and tears untold. I've been depressed most of my life. I have undergone psychiatric treatment for these things. So yeah, again, terrible childhood, which is usually, uh, as we know, how, how it happens, how, this, how these monsters are born. Moving into his teen years now, the abused, malnourished loner gets real interested in religion. His sister Carolyn said, when he was about 16, he went through Mobile, uh, the Mobile phone book, making a list of every church in Mobile and visited every one of them. Imagine that, going to every church in the city. He so badly wanted to find a purpose in life, to know why his life was shit. Why, why his dad left him? Why did his mom seem to hate him? Why was he suffering more than so many others around him? How sad, right? If the right person would have found him while he was doing this searching and helped him make, you know, make him feel safe and loved, understand how his lot in life was not his fault, how he'd be on his own soon and could build himself a new family of his own choosing. Well, over a dozen people, around 20 people, uh, might still be alive today. He was uh, briefly a member of Garner Ted Armstrong's Church of God. Garner Ted Armstrong, a popular evangelist when Jimmy was young, a man who had tearfully stepped down from the pulpit for a time in the mid-90s after being accused of a sexual assault. While denying the assault, he admitted infidelity. Uh, as a teen, Jimmy also briefly became a health food fattest, looking for secrets to a better life through various health and fitness trends and gimmicks. He would get into weightlifting and you know eat pretty well uh, in his pre-prison days. Jimmy was a seeker. He could have been a time sucker, a member of the cult of the curious. Someone who desperately wanted to find a greater purpose in life than just getting a job, getting married, having a house in the suburbs, you know, pumping out some kids, paying taxes, cheering for the favorite sports team, and then dying. Not that there's anything wrong with that, right? That life works great for many people, but not for Jimmy. He wanted something more. He wanted to be, be part of some kind of mission, to feel important. And he found his meaning and purpose in just about the worst possible place. He turned from Christianity to white supremacy teachings, to Nazism. At some point in the mid-1960s, Jimmy stole a copy of Mein Kampf from the Mobile Public Library, and he was fascinated by the book, according to FBI agent Douglas. Uh, when he was a teen, he was, quote, inspired to start a race war after reading Mein Kampf. He would later say, I've never felt that way about any other book that I read. It was something weird about that book. Uh, no, it wasn't something weird about that book, Jimmy. There was something weird going on with you. You were so angry and broken and looking for someone to blame, constantly feeling less than, inferior, rejected. And that book... You know, I bet as a young, put-upon white kid, better bet you feel strong, gave you an enemy, an enemy you were already familiar with, thanks to your pro-Nazi grandparents, and I bet your mother was racist as fuck. Uh, this book reminded you, you know, which boogeyman to blame for your mistreatment and shortcomings. Over 20 years ago now, in another life, when I was a new staff counselor at this crisis residential treatment center in Spokane, Washington, I remember being alarmed at how many teens in the area living on the street had white con or had connections, excuse me, to white supremacist groups. Uh, another guy, Roger, a veteran staff counselor there, good, smart dude. He told me that those kids weren't drawn to those groups because they were racist, like I assumed. Uh, they, were, they were drawn because they were white, they were living on the streets, almost always had been physically and sexually abused, been made to feel less than their whole lives, often bullied in school, you know, growing up jealous of what other kids had that they didn't, growing up feeling so goddamn alone, no one protecting them, no one seeming to give a shit whether they lived or died, no one seeming to love them. And recruiters for the white supremacist groups they'd find themselves in, the most important recruitment uh, tactics they employed were like love, inclusion, acceptance, safety. You know, these recruiters gave them a family, a group to be a valued member of. You know, they weren't white trash. They were members of a master race. They were poor by design, thanks to international Jewish bankers pulling the strings and seeking to destroy the non-Jewish white race. Jewish Illuminati members who would rather bestow opportunities on the black man because he was easier to control, easier to turn against the whites. That's the kind of bullshit they were fed. Fed by people who gave them a place to stay, gave them friends, gave them titles and responsibilities, gave them fucking high fives and hugs. I'll never forget Roger talking to me about all that and how it, uh, you know, it clicked then. And I understood that these kids, uh, you know, uh, or I understood them a lot better than I did before. And replaced a lot of my disgust with them with at least some empathy. Uh, Jimmy Clayton Vaughn Jr., he was one of these kids. You know, he could have been saved once before he became a, a bigger monster than the ones who tormented him. Jimmy's best friend in high school encouraged him to join the Nazi party, according to his sister Carolyn. She told the FBI he was looking for something before the Nazi thing. He attended, again, almost every church in Mobile. Fascinated with religion, searching for the meaning in things. Joseph now started subscribing to white supremacist publications wearing swastika armbands, which I imagine probably didn't make him uh, more popular at school. 
Not totally sure he uh, wore that shit at school, though. Uh, 17-year-old Jimmy dropped out of school before graduating in 1967, claimed he wanted to join the Marines, go fight in Vietnam. But he was not eligible for the draft, again, due to that vision loss in his right eye. Why, mother? Why would you not take baby boy to the eye doctor? He was able to join the Alabama National Guard, though. 1967, but was discharged four months later for lack of attendance and possession of a handgun whose serial number he had filed off. <laughs> what a dipshit. Joins the National Guard, but then barely shows up. And when he does show up, brings an illegal weapon. It's a fucking mess. After dropping out of high school, getting booted from the Alabama National Guard, Jimmy begins uh, getting into frequent scrapes with the police. He'll be arrested for uh, assault, carrying concealed weapons, disorderly conduct over the next few years. Some articles have stated he served some jail time for these offenses, but... Couldn't find his uh, actual arrest record for any crimes he may have committed before the eventual arrest that would send him to prison for the rest of his life. In February 1968, still 17-year-old Jimmy met a new girl in town named Bobby Louise Dorman, who was 16. They were married just two weeks later, and they would live happily ever after, just like all people, 17 and younger, who marry two weeks after meeting typically do. Uh, No, they were divorced in 10 months. Bobby was later interviewed by People Magazine a dozen years later, November of 1980, and she said... It was just one of them things. He was real kind and gentle at first. He said he was going to take care of me. And for a few weeks, it went okay. But then all of a sudden, he changed like night and day. Something was bothering him a lot, and he never told me what. He turned real cruel and violent. Several times, he beat me so hard, I was afraid he was going to kill me. She said Jimmy started experiencing severe headaches. Bobby came home twice and found him, quote, crying like a baby. I never dared ask why. Again, a lot of mental illness in this guy's family. He was clearly mentally ill on some level himself. 1968, the subsidized housing project in Mobile, Jimmy and Bobby lived in, was integrated, just like his childhood housing project had been. Led to a lot of uh, tension, uh, a notable upsurge in Klan and other segregationist sentiment, according to that same November 24th, 1980 People magazine article. During their brief marriage, Bobby found Joseph practicing Nazi salutes a few times in the mirror, and she saw that he had a swastika sewn into his work shirt. She said he had a lot of fantasies. He used to fantasize that he was a hell's angel. You know, he had the jeans and the jacket and he carried a knife, but he never owned a bike. (laughs) It was like James just wanted something to belong to, something different. I guess the Nazis were about as different as you could get. Yeah. Okay, a couple things here. Uh, First, where the fuck was he working? Where he felt comfortable sewing a swastika into his work shirt? Sources don't say. I want to assume that he sewed it into a place that was not visible or he was promptly fired, I hope. I know this was quite a few years ago, but I'm having a hard time thinking of a place that would require a work shirt but also, you know, just like, ah, Swaska, whatever. Uh, second thing, I-, I love that he dressed like he was a member of the Hells Angels, but didn't have a motorcycle. Can we all please believe that he rode a, uh, rode a bicycle <laughs> with his getup on? And not like a cool street bike or a mountain bike. No, like a, a Huffy, like a Huffy kid's bike. And the, and the job he had was a, was a paper route. His work shirt was a knockoff Hells Angels, you know, MC cut with a Swaska patch. Both the toughest and fucking saddest looking paper boy of all time. September 18th, 1970, Joseph was photographed in a Nazi uniform during a demonstration at the White House. He was protesting along with other members of the American Nazi Party the fact that Golda Meir, who was Israel's first and only uh, female prime minister, was visiting the White House. I'm I'm sure uh, the U.S. government uh, took their protest very seriously. I'm sorry, Miss Meir, but the U.S. will not be working with Israel again in any way in the foreseeable future. Mr. President has been forced to capitulate to the demands of a dozen or so white trash lunatics led by that angry skinny guy in the Hells Angels jacket riding the Huffy. He doesn't feel comfortable angering them any further. They are too powerful. No, they were ignored. Uh, Also by 1970, when Jimmy is 20, he starts to really become a drifter, moving around a lot. Uh, Even he won't seem to recall later uh, exactly where he was at any given time. But he did seem to spend uh, most of his time in Arlington, Virginia, headquarters of the American Nazi Party, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Washington, D.C., and Mobile, Alabama. Uh, the American Nazi Party, formed in March of 1959, is still around. How pathetic today. They're called New Order. And New Order's chief of staff since 2014, Martin Kerr, claims that the group is no longer a white supremacist group. They just focus on advocating uh, in favor of white people. Not against, this is his words, not against other races or ethnicities. Uh, we consider the white people of the world to be a gigantic family of racial brothers and sisters united by ties of common ancestry and common heritage. Being for our own family does not mean that we hate other families. Get the fuck out of here. Uh, I've talked about this before, but it's been a while. Uh, There is no racial unity. I wish everyone, uh, you know, had to sign up for a service like 23andMe and find out where their expressed genetic traits actually come from. How many people are all Irish or all Scandinavian? 
How many people are, are 100% European even? I bet at least a quarter of all white supremacists aren't even, quote, white. Not, not, not 100%. And what the fuck does it even mean to be white or black? Is it how you look? What if genetically you're 80% European, 10% African, 10% uh, Pakistani, but you look, quote, unquote, black? Does that mean you are black? What if you're a 60% African, uh, 40% European, but you look white? Are you white? This is why racism on a scientific level is so fucking stupid. We're all mixed, especially if you go back far enough. European ancestry doesn't begin in Europe, began in Africa. Today, most scientists I can find uh, who study genetics and the origins of our species believe that the very first Homo sapiens, common ancestors to everyone alive today, first walked in Africa. To quote the website of the UK's Natural History Museum, scientists are sure that Homo sapiens first evolved in Africa, and we know that every person alive today can trace their genetic ancestry to there. Uh, Jimmy's brother Carolyn would say that her brother's hatred for minorities deepened significantly after he joined the American Nazi Party. That makes sense. That, that tracks, adds up. Uh, Carolyn also said that the very last time she saw her brother was in 1973. He came to visit her, learned that their mother had died the year before. She said, Jimmy was gone. We didn't know where, uh, where when our mother died in 1972. A year later, he went back to our house, asked where the lady was who had lived there, and a little boy, to- little boy told him she was dead. That's a crazy way to find out that your parent has died. What a fucking weird life moment. Carolyn also said he was really changed. He was wearing a white karate suit. <laughs> and he got upset when he uh, saw I had a black mate. We fought about it. I told him he could leave if that was how he felt. Can we, can we talk about him showing up in a white karate suit for a moment? A gi? How much do you want to bet he was wearing a black belt, but hadn't earned a black belt? Uh, this again shows clearly that <laughs> Jimmy wasn't just racist. He's fucking nuts. That's some crazy shit to do. Show up at your sister's house out of the blue at 23 years old, wearing a fucking karate suit. Especially like as a, as a white supremacist. Did he not know that karate did not originate in Germany, but in Okinawa? That shit cracks me up about racists. Wouldn't want their kind to associate with, say, Mexicans. But have no problem heading to a Mexican-owned restaurant and grubbing on some enchiladas. Overall, they're just a real nonsensical, not real bright bunch. Uh, not long after seeing his older sister for the last time, Joseph spent some time in Marietta, Georgia, just northwest of Atlanta, where he'd earned his GED. I hope he's wearing his fucking karate suit. Well, he got that in December of 1974. March 1975, he was still living there. And he enrolled in DeKalb Community College, also joined the National States Rights Party. National States Rights Party was, of course, a white supremacist political party formed in Knoxville, Tennessee by 26-year-old chiropractor, Edward Reed Fields, who had been involved in white supremacist groups since high school and still is today at the age of 91. 91 years on earth, and he's still fucking dumb. So that's a long time to go without learning much. He's a real diehard, never gonna change piece of shit. Uh, this particular party of his, one of a few he founded, would dissolve by 1987. And at the height of their membership, only about a, he only had about a hundred dipshits. One of which was our boy, Jimmy. His younger sister, Marilyn, told the FBI that Joseph said he joined the National States Rights Party because someone in the American Nazi Party, which he was now no longer a member, was conspiring against him. This can be a pattern with Jimmy. He was not a group guy. A diehard white supremacist who could not, uh, you know, get along with anyone for very long, not even other white supremacists. He'll just leave one group after another. Also dabble with the KKK while he's in Georgia. While with the National States Rights Party, Joseph sold the party's newspaper called the Thunderbolt because they were super fucking cool out on the streets of Atlanta like the crazy person he was. Probably wearing a karate suit. He was that guy. The guy on the corner pushing a paper in your face. You know, if you looked white enough to him. Talking about big events. Big, ah, big, big stuff coming down the pipe. Gotta get ready. War's coming. Be scared. Be afraid. Get informed. Prepare for the revolution. Uh, soon though, he grew tired of the NSRP. They didn't take the action that he was craving. He didn't want to sell newspapers. He wanted to do shit that would get him written up in the paper. He moved to Washington, D.C., earned a blue belt in karate, which is actually not very impressive. And he lived in an abandoned office building <laughs> where he worked as a maintenance man. That's how you know you're fucking supreme when you have a blue belt in karate and you live in an abandoned office building <laughs> where you're working as a maintenance guy. Uh, typically, a blue belt is just one belt above white belt. <laughs> <laughs> and he and he just got that belt, you know, a year or three after showing up at his sister Carolyn's house in a white karate suit, which means he was about as good at karate as he was at understanding how dumb racism is. 1976, Jimmy's younger sister Marilyn moved in with him for a while while he was living in that abandoned office building in the Washington suburb of Hyattsville, Maryland. She said if he ever saw a white and black together, he'd go right up and say, that's disgusting or something like that. Lots of people don't like the colored, 
but he was one to let you know it. She also sounds super fucking racist. You got that blue belt confidence. Sue was not a huge dude. He did get bigger towards, you know, uh, over the years, but, you know, he's 5'11". I think he's still pretty thin at this time. I- I'm guessing he was not approaching any large black men dating white women. I bet he was approaching the occasional, real small, timid-looking kind of nerdy dude who wasn't uh, anywhere near uh, that many other black people. I bet, I bet Jimmy was very selective when it came to who he approached to speak his mind to, as opposed to what Marilyn said. He told her he was done with the uh, the state's rights party and the KKK soon after she uh, started to live with him. Claimed that he left the KKK due to FBI harassment, but also they weren't dedicated enough. Joseph said he joined a new radical right-wing organization, but Marilyn couldn't remember which one it was. Uh, he also told his sister that he had shot a black man in the chest, managed to escape a police roadblock after he did it. Didn't say when or where the murder occurred. She didn't know if he was telling the truth. Marilyn later told the FBI she didn't think his brother, her brother was capable of killing, at least not at that time. She also said she didn't stay with her brother long because she started dating a Hispanic guy she would later marry. She was scared of how her brother would react if he found out because, you know, he wouldn't consider her husband white. She also noticed how he uh, started to refuse to eat in restaurants if they employed black people. Right? He's doubling down more and more, getting more and more racist. It goes further to this fucking rabbit hole of his. September 8th, 1976, Joseph is arrested for assault and battery in Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. The day before, September 7th, the 26-year-old karate legend uh, maced an unnamed interracial couple. Surprised he didn't fucking karate chop him. Probably forgot how. He maced this interracial couple. He followed from the Kennedy Center in D.C. to a location 10 miles away in Montgomery County, Maryland. Trapped them on a dead-end street. Sprayed them. The male victim, Aaron Keith Miles, who was black, got his license plate number, reported him to the police. Uh, Jimmy then did not appear for his trial in December, and a warrant was issued for his arrest. Uh, but he would never go to trial for those charges. Just before that incident, he had applied to legally change his name. He also told the court clerk when he handed in his paperwork that he had plans to immigrate and join the armed forces of Rhodesia. Because he's a fucking tough motherfucker. Rhodesia was an unrecognized state in Southern Africa that existed from 1965 to 1979, about the size of Zimbabwe today. It was attempting to be a successor state to the British colony of Southern Rhodesia. And along with South Africa, it was one of two independent states on the African continent where a teeny tiny minority of white people uh, you know, people of primarily European, European descent and culture were ruling over a massive majority population of those of primarily African descent and culture. By 1976, the white Rhodesian government had been battling black insurgent forces for years in what became known as the Rhodesian Bush War. And Jimmy, of course, was considering heading to Africa to help violently suppress the black population. Jimmy's petition to change his name was approved two weeks after he maced that interracial couple and the name change helped him avoid arrest because now his warrant was no longer in his name. Now Joseph Clayton Vaughn Jr. had become Joseph Paul Franklin, karate master. Around this time, Joseph, uh, can we call him Jimmy Joe? I like Jimmy Joe. Uh, he had a Grim Reaper tattooed on his right forearm as a symbol of the mission formulated in his mind now. One he's almost ready to begin with. Right? Killing minorities, bombing synagogues, in a delusional hope that this will incite a major race war. He also asked the same tattoo artist to write Helter Skelter on his other arm. <laughs> and the tattoo artist uh, said no. So he didn't get that one. I love it. Uh, what? Uh, Helter Skelter. The, the Charles Manson race war shit? Uh, nah, dude. Get the fuck out of here with that shit. Uh, remember what Manson's Helter Skelter was? So crazy. He thought he heard secret messages because he was out of his mind. In the lyrics of the Beatles song Helter Skelter, which was featured on their White Album, amazing album, uh, came out in November 1968. M- Manson was listening to it within a month. He listened over and over again. He became obsessed with it and he started to believe uh, being because he was out of his mind, that the Beatles were sending messages specifically to him through their songs. They were telling him that a race war was inevitable and that he would play a major role. And on New Year's Eve, 1968, he presented his vision of Helter Skelter to his followers, his family at Myers Ranch near Death Valley, California at that time. Uh, he was to create another album. And this album would have other, more messages in it. and It would inspire millions to take up arms in an apocalyptic struggle. In his vision, America's white women would join up with his family in such numbers because he has such charisma that black men would no longer have access to them. There'd be a fucking shortage of hot white women. And then sexually frustrated that they could no longer get to fuck their hot hippie white ladies. They'd start to lash out and commit violent crimes against us whites. And the violence would lead to more violence, back and forth, retaliations, uprising, uh, police and military crackdowns, riots, whites attacking blacks, blacks attacking whites, back and forth until eventually all white people were dead except... Charles Manson and his family, who were hiding 
during this race war in a secret underground fucking city. Yes, underneath Death Valley that they accessed through a cave. <laughs> and once the war was over, they climbed back up. And the Manson family, you know, they, they come back up and, and the black victors, not realizing they weren't capable of running a government now, frustrated that they didn't have any white people to run a government, would turn to them and put them in charge. Yep, that was the whole plan. That was Manson's vision. <laughs> and if you don't think that, that makes any sense on any level, yeah, you're right. It doesn't. But Manson and a few strung up members of his family did. And later, Jimmy Joseph Franklin did. Or at least he liked the basic premise. Uh, 1977 was the year Franklin's murder spree began. If he didn't shoot that unarmed black man in the chest like he claimed to his sister. That might have just been fantasy. Build himself up, preparing to do it for real. Uh, Joseph would now spend the next three years wandering across the South and Midwest, primarily, employing at least 18 pseudonyms, changing cars and weapons frequently, dyeing his hair so often it came close to falling out. Along the way, he killed at least uh, 13 people. Numbers vary from source to source. Uh, he probably killed about 21 uh, in a frenzied one-man war against minorities. Joseph Frank was 27 years old when he started this killing spree, and he'd rob up to 16 banks along the way to fund it. On July 25th, 1977, his first true act of war, he detonated a trunk load of dynamite outside the Rockville, Maryland home of Morris Amate, a pro-Israel Jewish lobbyist, the executive director of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. While the home was very badly damaged, Amate and his family were thankfully able to escape unharmed. Joseph was never arrested for this crime or even a prime suspect. He would later confess while in prison, as uh, is the case for most of his crimes. Amate, his wife, three children were asleep in the home when the explosion went off at 3.20 in the morning. The police found a 400-foot extension cord running from the back of the house to a nearby street where the bomb had been detonated. The blast was so powerful, it literally lifted part of the roof off of the house next door and shattered their windows. In fact, homes five blocks away would have broken windows. Sadly, the family's beagle puppy was killed during the explosion. Bojangles already hated this guy. Now he for sure wants him to die. Uh, I wonder if Jimmy Joe felt bad about killing the puppy. Or since the puppy belonged to a Jewish family, did he believe that the puppy was Jewish? Like, how do white supremacists feel about the pets of minorities they hate? Like, does their hatred extend to them as well? We need to kill all the blacks and the Jews. We also need to kill our black and Jew dog and cats. If not stopped, these black and Jew dogs and cats will fuck all the white out of the world's pure Aryan white dogs and white cats. The Illuminati doesn't want to only eliminate white people. They want to eliminate white in all forms. No more white dogs and white cats. No more Aryan goldfish, Aryan gerbils, and white snakes and parakeets, white chinchillas and horses, and rabbits and cockatiels, Japanese white fighting fish. Is that a world you won't live in? What will your white children can all gaze upon the white Japanese fighting fish whilst they're petting the white bunny rabbits and daydreaming about adding a white uh, bearded dragon uh, to their Aryan reptile collection. July 29, 1977, the Beth Shalom Synagogue in Chattanooga, Tennessee, destroyed by another bomb. Joseph would also later confess to this crime. Stephen Drysdale from the Chattanooga Jewish Welfare Federation told the Jewish Telegraphic Agency that the explosion was apparently premeditated. Wires were found leading from the synagogue to a motel 100 yards away. The explosion completely destroyed the synagogue and the blast was heard all over town. Fortunately, again, no one was harmed. Congress had been gathered, excuse me, the synagogue, uh, for evening Shabbat services uh, prior to the explosion, but they left early due to a, a poor turnout. Drysdale said that they normally would have still been at the synagogue at 8.50 when the explosion happened. The synagogue was the only synagogue for Orthodox Jews in Chattanooga. The explosion damaged the inner structure of the synagogue collapsed most of the wall on the frame building and blew off the roof. Blast was centered in the kitchen area. Eight men had been present about an hour before the blast, but left because they needed 10 people present to have their meeting. Had just two more people showed up that night, Jimmy Joe would have likely uh, have killed all of them. Less than two weeks later, he does kill. August 7th, 1977, Joseph Franklin shoots and kills 23-year-old Alphonse Manning, a black man, and 23-year-old Tony Schwen, a white woman, for being an interracial couple in Madison, Wisconsin. Joseph shot Alphonse and Tony just after he robbed a bank in the area. The murders occurred after an altercation in a shopping mall parking lot. Alphonse backed his car up in front of Mr. Franklin's, momentarily blocking him from leaving, and that pissed him off enough to uh, pop out of the car and shoot him. Joseph will confess these murders February 17, 1984. The prosecutor in his trial for these killings called the murders the closest thing to killing for sport he had ever seen. Two months later, almost to the day, October 8th, 1977, Joseph kills again. 
Now he murders Gerald Gordon at the Brith Shalom uh, Knesset Israel Congregation, a synagogue in Richmond Heights, which is a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri. Joe shot at numerous people that day, only killing Gordon, a 42-year-old Jewish father of three who worked as a salesman for a packaging materials supplier. Joseph wouldn't confess to this murder until 1995. Joseph picked the synagogue where Gerald was killed simply by looking through the St. Louis yellow pages. Spent that morning planning his attack. Then he hid in some tall grass behind a telephone pole outside the synagogue, waiting for people to exit. On this day, there was a bar mitzvah, 13-year-old Ricky Kalina's bar mitzvah. What began a, a, with a beautiful ceremony ended with him seeing a family friend get shot dead and two others wounded. Joseph shot at the group of people exiting the synagogue five times. About 200 guests were present in total that day. Gerald, Gol Gerald Gordon was killed directly in front of his wife and his three young kids. Gordon died in the hospital about two, year, two hours after he was shot. Another victim was 30-year-old William Lee Ash, hit in the left hand and hip by the same bullet. He'd lose two fingers, but survived his injuries. Final victim was a man named Stephen Goldman, who was shot through his suit coat, but not seriously injured because the bullet just barely grazed his skin. Investigators later found that the sniper made a stand to hold the rifle steady about three to 400 feet away from the parking lot by driving two spikes into a telephone pole. A semi-automatic rifle with a telescopic sight was found at the foot of the telephone pole with five spent shells. Joe just left it at the scene so he wouldn't be witnessed walking around with a sniper rifle. An empty five-round clip was found in the rifle and police found a black guitar case most likely used to carry the gun to that location. The serial number had been scratched off so investigators could not trace the weapon to Joe. William Ash's wife recalled that she initially thought the shots were firecrackers until she saw that her husband and Gerald, uh, you know, were shot, you know, were bleeding. Her husband shouted at her to grab their child after he had been shot. Loved that so much. And she grabbed their two-year-old son and ran back inside. Hail William Ash, you tough motherfucker. Gerald's wife, Sheila, was standing next to their car. They were about to get in and drive home. Then she saw her husband fall back onto the pavement. Other guests exiting the bar mitzvah stayed inside thanks to some kids running into the auditorium screaming, they're shooting people, they're killing people. A St. Louis County helicopter crew did see a man later believed to be the sniper running across a pedestrian overpass, but obviously not identified or captured. For almost 20 years, none of the people shot at would have any idea who had done the shooting. Had they been, uh, you know, uh, targeted for, uh, uh, you know, for some specific reason? Had the shooter been caught for other crimes? Had they, had they died? Were they, were they local? Would they come back to do it again? Four months later, February 2nd, 1970, Joseph Franklin shot a young interracial couple in Atlanta. 22-year-old black man, Johnny Brookshire, and his 23-year-old white wife, Joy Williams. Johnny was killed and Joy was paralyzed from the waist down. She was also pregnant at the time of the attack. And for over 20 years, Joy would have no idea who killed her husband, who shot her, why they did it. Joseph won't confess to this murder until late October of 1999. He'd say he uh, shot at Johnny and Joy because he didn't like them uh, walking down the street together. Just didn't like the way it looked. That's it. He gave his confession to Atlanta Homicide Sergeant Keith Meadows and Detective Tony Volkaday. Meadows told a local news reporter he knew facts about the murders that only the murderer could have known. He was able to tell us exactly what the victims were wearing at the time the shooting took place. Gerald would choose to, uh, uh, or Georgia, excuse me, would choose not to have him transported for a trial since by 1999, it was clear that due to all his other convictions, you know, he was never getting out of prison. And uh, he'd already tried to escape prison and escaping would be easier if he was transported. A month later, March 6, 1970, Jimmy Joe shook up his style a bit and shot at a white guy on purpose. He shot Hustler Magazine publisher, 35-year-old porn provocateur Larry Flint and his lawyer, 47-year-old Gene Reeves in Lawrenceville, Georgia, after they exited a popular restaurant where they'd had lunch following Flint testifying that morning in an obscenity trial against him. Reeves would nearly die. He would spend 26 days in the hospital. He'd been shot in the arm, rushing to uh, Larry after Larry had been shot. Bullet went through his arm, entered the side of his torso. Larry Flint was shot in the stomach and the bullet damaged his spine, permanently paralyzing him from the waist down. The attack would leave Flint in, chron in chronic pain that would lead to an addiction to opioid painkillers until his nerve pain was deadened following several surgeries. His opioid addiction would then lead to a stroke caused by an overdose that left him with slurred speech for the rest of his life. Joe targeted Flint in retaliation for Hustler publishing photos of an interracial couple. Franklin said about the December 1975 issue of Hustler, I saw that interracial couple he had photographed there having sex. Just made me sick. I think whites marry with whites, blacks with blacks. I threw the magazine down and thought, I'm going to kill that guy. I did some research to track down those photos. Thank you, random internet perverts, for uploading them. Hail, Lucifina. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's fucking crazy. You can look up any old like porn magazine 
And if you do enough specific searching, you'll find the photos. Uh, the spread he's talking about uh, is a picture of a black man named Butch Williams <laughs> who had a 14-inch dick, a 14-inch third leg, pretending to be a penis. And a petite white woman only identified as peaches, assuming that's not a birthday. Uh, the pictorial was titled A Black Stud and His Georgia Peach. And much tamer than today's porn, by the way. In any pic where you can see Butch's massive dick, uh, it is limp. There are pics where it looks like they might be having sex, but also just could be faking it. No penetration shots. Uh, the raciest pic is one where Butch is going down on peaches and squeezing her breasts. And he might just have his face down there. You don't even know if he's doing anything. I, I wonder, was Jimmy Joe really mad about the interracial sex or was he mad that this beautiful young white woman seemed to really be enjoying the presence of Butch's 14-inch monster cock? Guessing that Jimmy Joe was packing a little bit less than that. Maybe like 12 or 13 inches less. He does not come across ever as a dude with a, with a lot of big dick energy. Investigators later found 44 Magnum shells, not condoms, at the crime scene. Jimmy Joe had used a 44 caliber semi-automatic rifle. Uh, Larry and Gene would have no idea who had done this to them for the next six years. Danny Porter, Gwinnett County D, uh, District Attorney, said that several years after Larry Flint's shooting, they received a letter from Joseph Paul Franklin from Marion, Illinois, where he was already incarcerated. It read, my name is Joseph Paul Franklin. I shot Larry Flint. If you bring me to Gwinnett County, I'll tell you about it. He just wanted to fucking get out of the prison for a little bit. Initially, Joseph told the police that the letter was just a hoax, but he eventually cooperated and the Georgia police believed he was telling the truth after some interviews. Uh, Joe was able to describe the abandoned building he shot from, his escape route, the vehicle, and where he drove. He was indicted in 1984, but they didn't pursue a trial because, again, they had enough other stuff on him. Uh, Porter told the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, we're sort of at the end of the line because he's facing murder in every jurisdiction but ours. We could give him 20 years max. I'm not sure that would be a good use of the taxpayer's money. And I'm not in a hurry to bring Larry Flint and the rolling circus he brings with him back for trial. Oh, n not Larry Flint and his circus. Uh, he'll, he'll bring women who, who, who have shown their bodies for money. Oh, dear. What might that do to the moral fabric of the area? Mothers, sisters, daughters might rip off their clothes and run through the streets. They might, they might have, have sex with, with black men. Almost five months after his attack on Larry Flint and his lawyer. On July 29th, 1978, in a Pizza Hut parking lot in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Joseph Franklin now shoots 20-year-old Bryant Tatum, black student at the University of Chattanooga, and 18-year-old Nancy Hilton, a white woman who worked at Pizza Hut. The two were dating. Bryant was killed, but Nancy would survive. Joseph shot Brian and Nancy from a patch of tall grass near the parking lot, and he would not admit to those killings for almost 20 years, not until 1995. Brian and Nancy were leaving the pizza parlor, shot as they were getting into Brian's car. Tim Carroll, the original investigator of the 1978 Chattanooga shooting, uh, told Local 3 News that he received a phone call from Joseph Franklin in 1995. I asked him, I said, so, okay, you're calling, why now? He said, I, I want to have the most death penalty cases pending against anybody that's currently in custody. He said, I've killed several people. What a weird, pathetic thing to want. How sad is your life when that's what you want? That's, that's some strange death row bragging rights. <laughs> oh, you have a death sentence? So what, motherfucker? I should be on death row in six states right now. Six. If the governor here commutes my sentence, pfft, they'll take me to a different death row, you lucky son of a bitch. Good thing you're not as evil and tough as me. You, you little candy-ass death row. <laughs> oh, you really have something to worry about if you had six, not just one. Like a fucking little bitch, death row sentence. Uh, Carol drove to St. Louis to talk to Joseph about the murders. Uh, Jimmy Joe told him that his purpose in coming to Chattanooga was to find interracial couples. And he first spotted Brian Tatum and Nancy Hilton leaving the movies together, holding hands, kissing, looking in love, not doing anything wrong. How dare they? He followed them to Pizza Hut, parked his car on the road, left the hood up to make it seem like the car was broken down, then hid in the grass behind his car, shot at the couple as they left. He bragged in his 1995 confession, saying with pride, I hit him square in the chest. Uh, the spring of 1979, Joseph takes a break from killing and he gets married again. Oh, yeah. Uh, the now 29-year-old uh, marries Anita Carden Cooper, who was just 16 years old. Ah, what, a lucky, what a lucky lady. What a lucky kid. Uh, Jimmy Joe, like a lot of almost 30-year-olds trying to fuck a kid, met Anita at an ice cream parlor. This one was in Montgomery, Alabama. Dairy Delight. And naturally... It was white-owned ice cream parlor that only served vanilla ice cream. And, not, and no French vanilla. Frog shit. Neither. Oh, fuck no. No, this is real pure Aryan vanilla ice cream made from white master race milk. 
They come from an all-white Aryan cow. No, no brown spots, motherfucker. Uh, milked by a white farmhand whose pure Aryan ancestry can be traced back to medieval Germany. Churned into cream, white cream, by another white of equal pedigree. Frozen in an all-white, not cream color freezer. Stored in an all-white container, driven to the ice cream shop. In an all-white truck, driven by an Aryan man in a pure, untainted, white milkman's outfit. It wasn't even called vanilla ice cream. It was called white is right. How Hitler cream. I have no fucking idea what kind of ice cream they served. Uh, Nita's brother Don later told the Birmingham Post Herald that when things were good, Joseph was generous. Uh, he bought Anita a stereo, bought Don a motorcycle, but then also just up and left with no explanation after seven months. Uh, probably took him that long to figure out that the name Anita is of Spanish origin. Mm-hmm. Means grace or unguided. What it doesn't mean is white power. He probably figured out who the fuck she really was, how she tricked him. When she made like tacos or something for dinner one night. Oh, tacos. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right. How fuck do you know how to make tacos, Nita? And then she's probably like, I don't know. I just make them like my mama taught me. And then he's, he's like, felt sick. He felt dizzy. And he flashed on being at her, at her mom's house. And it all came together. And he saw a picture on the wall of her great grandpa. A man with a thick, dark mustache. And pretty tan skin. Almost like a Spanish level of tan. Maybe Argentinian. Maybe Chilean. Perhaps Mexican. He sh- oh, shuddered. Then he remembered overhearing Anita talk about how she'd like to learn how to, how to salsa dance someday. And how she loved to watch I Love Lucy with her mom. And who was Lucy married to on that show? Fucking Ricky Ricardo. Desi Arnaz. A, a fucking Cuban. One, one of those island Mexicans. Destroying the purity of the master race by fucking white women. And he just screamed, oh, my God. Why would you trick me like this? And he ran into the bathroom. And he started just vomiting. He just threw up. And he brushed his teeth and tongue. And he washed his mouth out. Thinking about the times he kissed her Spanish lips. Both sets. And he scrubbed his wean clean. Thrown up again. Thinking about how it had been inserted over and over into her. Very clean, warm, tight, moist Spanish vagina. And it smelled so good. And then he scrubbed his butthole. Thinking about how many times she had pegged him with her giant ribbed Spanish dildo. With no lube as he had demanded. And then he came hard. Thinking about all that. Which made him throw up again. He hated himself for how much he liked it. And then he jumped on the motorcycle he, he gave to her not white Spanish brother after he thoroughly disinfected it. And then rode off into the night like the strong white knight he was in his fucking karate gi, never to return. Uh, this would be his last long-term romantic relationship. At, at least during the not incarcerated period of his life. I, I think the last one period. No mention of uh, him uh, getting, getting busy with any ladies while in prison. Any conjugal visits. Uh, after he left Anita Bonita. Ooh, embacador mexicano. Uh, if you can believe Jimmy Joe, he had many relationships with different women, like like short ones, you know, sex sexual ones. I doubted that when I first read it. His later photos, oof, do they not scream ladies, man? They, they scream fucking crazy weirdo out in the cabin who all women are afraid of. I thought he looked about as handsome as uh, old Richard Bird, if you recall that ugly devilish bastard. Uh, but young Jimmy Joe, while I hate to say it, was actually a somewhat handsome guy who didn't look like he just crawled out of a meth lab almost before it exploded. During his murder spree, he got into bodybuilding. He's eating really well. No longer really skinny. He's fairly muscle bound. Also, the girls he was dating, like his wife, uh, were teenagers. So different standards. Uh, he preferred teens, which speaks a lot to his lack of psychological development. Uh, Jimmy Joe, uh, again, according to Jimmy Joe, changed identities as fast as he changed women. Oh, he's a fucking stud. He moved around the South, Midwest, used at least 17 different aliases, dyed his hair so much started falling out. Young Anita never knew much about her husband, according to an interview. Featured again in the big article about Joseph Franklin in People Magazine in November of 1980. Anita thought she was married to a guy named James Cooper, a plumber. She said Joseph told her he was responsible for 12 murders and four bank robberies, though. Okay, that's quite a, that's a hell of a plumber. What a catch. July 12, 1979, 27-year-old Harold McIver, a black Taco Bell manager in Doraville, Georgia, northeast suburb of Atlanta, is fatally shot through a window at Taco Bell by somebody 150 yards away. This is another killing Jimmy Joe would not confess to for over 20 years. He confessed this murder in 1998. He was indicted, not tried. He would say that he killed Harold because Harold was, quote, in close contact with white women. And he believed he was probably hitting on them. Jimmy Joe didn't even want black and whites to make chalupas, gorditas, Mexican pizzas together. Also, anyone else surprised to hear that there was a Taco Bell in 1979? I thought they were more recent than that. Uh, yeah, they opened their first store in 1962, down in California. I might have covered that a long time ago, but I forget. Uh, just two years later, 1964, they were already opening more franchises. Uh, by the time they uh, went public in 1970, they had about 300, not about, they had exactly 325 locations. Their growth almost as explosive as the diarrhea 
that often directly follows eating their delicious food. Uh, back to Harold, that poor bastard got gunned down while working at Taco Bell on a day he wasn't even supposed to be there. It was his day off. But he came in to fix an issue with the cash register. And then he got shot as he left the store. Five weeks later, August 18th, 1979, Joseph kills again. 28-year-old Raymond Elton Turner, a black man, the night manager at Burger King. It's really fucking going after the fast food people. And Falls Church, Virginia, suburb of Washington, D.C. Man, shooting unarmed people at Taco Bell Burger King Pizza Hut. What a brave revolutionary. Joseph, again, won't confess this killing until about two decades later. February of 1997, Joseph Franklin will be interviewed for Inside Edition, and that's when he'll admit to shooting Raymond. Uh, Turner was sitting at a table near an exit. A uh, bullet went through the window, hit him in the chest. The police speculated the shooter was about 15 yards away. Excuse me, Joseph called the murder a lucky shot. He gave no motive, just told reporter Janet tomorrow, they've named me as a suspect, but I've never confessed to it. So you're the first reporter I've confessed to. Janet was, at the time, an attractive 35-year-old television journalist, and her looks matter here. After his arrest, detectives will learn that if they really wanted to get Jimmy Joe to admit to something, their best chance by far was to send in a pretty girl, a pretty white girl. He loved getting attention from attractive white women. Uh, a week after he guns down the innocent manager of Burger King, just for being black, uh, Anita gives birth to her and Joseph's daughter, Lori. Unclear if he and Anita are still together at this point. By the following fall, they'll have definitely uh, separated. Two months later, October 21st, 1979, Joseph shoots and kills 42-year-old Jesse Eugene Taylor, a black man, and 31-year-old Marion Vera Brissett, a white woman, in a grocery store parking lot in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. They were boyfriend and girlfriend. Jesse was shot three times. Marion was shot once. Joseph killed him because they were an interracial couple. They lived together, worked at the same nursing home. They'd stopped at the grocery store to buy apples after coming back from a fucking hula hoop contest at a park. Could they be more wholesome? Marion's three kids waited in the car while she and Jesse went inside. Jimmy Joe hid behind a row of trees 75 to 100 yards away. Didn't give a shit that the kids were there. Jesse was shot three times after he walked back to the car. Marion shot once as she ran to help him. Most witnesses thought the gunshots were a car backfiring. One store employee said he heard Jesse say, Oh my God, after he was shot the first time. Richard Brissett, gotta get at least, got at least one dick in here. Uh, Marion's son, uh, who was just 10 at the time, later told a reporter for the Oklahoman, we was yelling at my mom, get down, get down, get down. Even though we was little kids, we knew what, we was going, what was going on. He also said they didn't see their mother get shot because Jesse's blood covered the window. Man, what a horrible life moment. One I imagine would flow back up in your mind over and over, probably when you least wanted it to for the rest of your life. The children were unsurprisingly extremely traumatized by the shooting. Further victims that Jimmy Joe never got properly punished for hurting. Marion's daughter, Candy Moreno, said that she became addicted to drugs at the age of 12 and that even though she was white, she hated white people for a long period of time. Uh, Richard went on to attempt suicide. Marion Junga's child, Doug Brissett, did either take his own life or died of a drug-related accident. He was found with a bag over his head in 1995. Probably put on to help him get high sniffing some glue or Freon. Oof. Joseph left behind the casings of a high-caliber rifle in a grove of trees 75 yards away. Family would have to wait years to know who did it. 1991, Joseph would be charged with two counts of first-degree murder in Oklahoma after his cellmate told police he confessed to, a shooting, uh, confessed to shooting a white woman with a black man in a parking lot in Oklahoma. But then the case was dropped in 1983 after prosecutors learned a key witness was paid a $15,000 reward for his cooperation. So Jimmy Joe got away with that one. Seven weeks later, December 5th, 1979, Joseph shoots and kills one of his white teenage lovers, 15-year-old Mercedes Masters in DeKalb County, Georgia. Unlike the other victims, she was shot at close range. Her body was found December 25th, Christmas Day, near Lithonia, Georgia, a little town on the edge of the eastern edge of the Atlanta suburbs. She was found in the backyard of an abandoned house by some prospective land buyers, been shot in the back of the head execution style. Franklin later comp- confessed that he spent several days with Mercedes after picking her up while she was hitchhiking, romancing it up, uh, then decided to kill her after he learned that she'd had sex with black men. Probably couldn't stop thinking about that hustler spread with Butch and Peaches. And Butch's 14-inch meat sword. This is another murder that took nearly 20 years to solve. Joseph admitted to the murder uh, to an assistant district attorney, March 26, 1998. He was indicted for that murder, but never tried. Like I mentioned, with uh, another murder, you know, they already had enough on him at that point to keep him off the streets forever. The beaten boy becomes the killer. So calm with these fucks. The victim becomes the worst victimizer than anyone who had ever harmed him. Found out some young girl was dating uh, black men at one point and killed her. For that, a 15-year-old. 
month later, around 11 p.m., January 12, 1980, Joseph now fatally shoots 23-year-old Larry Reese, Lawrence E. Reese, young black man who was standing in line inside of Church's Fried Chicken in Indianapolis, waiting for a late dinner. Larry was shot once in the back from an estimated distance of 150 yards, pronounced dead hours later at the Methodist Hospital. Charges will be filed in this case uh, the following year, but no long wait with that one. Uh, just 48, year, uh, 48 years, just 48 years later, just 48 hours later, 19-year-old Leo Thomas Watkins, young black man, a teenager, a kid, uh, was killed on January 14th, 1980. Leo working as a pest exterminator with his dad, and the two had been called in for a job at the Quick Pick Market grocery store inside an Indianapolis mall. Leo and Larry, previous victim, did not know each other, didn't have any known enemies. Police initially were looking for a connection. Police now worry the sniper was an unbalanced person shooting at random. Bingo! Asterix. Shooting at random people of specific races. Or people who had sexual relationships with people of the non-white variety. Leo was with his dad, Tom, that day. A single gunshot shattered the store window and his son, uh, you know, hit his son. Tom would later say, I just stood there and watched my boy die. Holy fuck. That would haunt you forever. Shot came from a clump of trees about 100 yards away. Leo shot with a 30 caliber rifle. Same kind that killed Larry Reese. Nearly four months later, May 3rd, 1980, the dead body of a young white woman, 20-year-old Rebecca Bergstrom, found in Mill Bluff State Park near Camp Douglas, out in the middle of nowhere, rural central Wisconsin, far from Georgia, far from Indianapolis. Uh, she had been shot twice in the back, once in the back of the head. Uh, two teenagers found her body just up a hiking trail. The coroner who examined her remains, Gary Winningham, said she could have been dead for up to two days. Spent shells were found at the scene, and the sheriff said Rebecca was apparently shot by a handgun. Evidence indicated she was shot by someone she knew or someone she had hitched a ride with. Rebecca was the daughter of two hog farmers attending vocational school in Madison and working full-time. Her passport was found in her body, which made it very easy to identify her. Rebecca was supposed to pick up her car, head home to spend the summer working on the farm and at a nearby bank. Joseph confessed to the Bergstrom murder three years later in 1984. Said he picked her up while she was hitchhiking. Said he killed Rebecca because she told him she had dated a Jamaican man while she was on spring break a few weeks earlier. Jimmy Joe hated it. When black men dated young, attractive white women. Never killed any black women for dating white men. Was this really about a race war? Or did some black guy take his girlfriend at some point when he was uh, living in one of those recently integrated housing projects? Uh, did they date several girls that he longed for who were not interested in him? Is that the real reason he was so furious? Did he, did he actually have a really tiny dick? Was he so painfully insecure that he, he just couldn't get past the thought of a black man having sex with a woman? Uh, he was sexually interested in, in pleasing her more than he ever could. Less than a month later, he's back in Indiana. May 29th, 1980, Joseph shot at civil rights activist, then president of the National Urban League, Vernon Jordan Jr., a black man after he saw him with a white woman in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, National Urban League, formerly known as the National League of, on Urban Conditions Amongst Negroes, is a nonpartisan historic civil rights organization based in New York City that advocates on behalf of economic and social justice for African Americans and against racial discrimination in the U.S., it's the oldest and largest community-based organization of its kind in America. 44-year-old uh, Vernon Jordan was shot in the back at 2 a.m. as he got out of a car in the parking lot of the Fort Wayne Marriott Inn. Vernon Jordan was in Fort Wayne for an Urban League speech. President Jimmy Carter said he believed Jordan was a target, uh, target of an assassination attempt. FBI Director William Webster said that agents believed Jordan was a target of a conspiracy and the shooting was the work of apparently more than one person in a premeditated act. Martha Coleman, the white woman he was with when he was shot, was an Urban League volunteer who took Jordan back to the hotel after she had, uh, the two had went out to get a snack. Jimmy Joe never suspected this crime. Uh, at the time, law enforcement still didn't have a clue who this dude was. And he was helped by a car full of other assholes that night who shouted racial slurs at Vernon as he was dropped off at the hotel. Vulgarities also hurled at Martha regarding her being a white woman with a black man. Fort Wayne, uh, racist as fuck, apparently, back in 1980. At 11.30 p.m., June 8th, 1980, Cousins, just a couple kids, 14-year-old Daryl Lane, 13-year-old Dante Evans-Brown, walk into a convenience store in Bond Hill, Cincinnati to get some candy. Both shot with a 44 caliber rifle by a sniper perched on a nearby railroad trestle. Boys were walking down Reading Road to buy, the, again, some candy. Joseph Frank was, of course, a sniper hiding on that top of that train trestle. Said he planned to shoot the first black man he saw with a white woman. And then he literally just got bored. Got tired of waiting for an interracial couple to show up. And just thought, I don't know, fuck it. Why not kill some kids instead? He would later say he didn't realize Dante and Daryl were kids. Bullshit. Uh, he sure shit did not seem remorseful when he said it. Daryl died right there in the street. 
Uh, his sister heard the shots, would testify that she ran down the street, saw him being put into an ambulance. Dante will die three days later after fighting for his life and briefly regaining consciousness in the hospital. Dante's mother, Abby, got the call that her son had been shot and was in the hospital when she was at a, uh, and was in the hospital when she was at a graduation party. Decades later in 2013, she'll say, they were working on him when I got there. I thought, who would do this to him? They said he was in bad shape and I fell in the hallway. Days later, Daryl's funeral, she got another call, get to the hospital if you want to see your son alive again. She said, I went in and seen all these tubes. He was trying to say something. I just put my finger to my mouth. She said, it's devastating. It's a void. You never get over it. So much unnecessary pain caused by a dude who knew what it was like to feel so much unnecessary pain. Carolyn Brown, their uh, grandmother, the boy's grandmother, told the Cincinnati Post about how she found one of the boys on the street. She said, I heard some shots and I grabbed my shoes and ran. When I got there, he was lying on the street. Daryl had been shot in the heart. Dante had been shot three times, chest, stomach, and knee. Police couldn't find the exact spot where the sniper uh, hit initially, but theorized he could have shot from a railroad trestle above Reading Road, 50 feet from the boys. Daryl lived with his grandma, Carolyn Brown. Carolyn said they were watching TV at home. Daryl and his cousin, Dante, said they wanted to go to the store about two blocks away. She told him to hurry because it was late. And a couple minutes later, she heard gunshots. Cincinnati police would start to suspect Joseph Franklin finally within a few months of the shootings, but initially they were clueless. There were no witnesses and Franklin had sold the rifle. Rifle they, uh, that couldn't be found despite newspaper ads uh, offering a reward. While law enforcement and victims' families struggle with more inexplicable killings, Joseph Paul Franklin killed again. I said a few months, about a, almost a year later when they started to suspect Joseph for that uh, incident, for those killings. Uh, just a week after killing two children on June 5th, 1980, Joseph fatally shot 22-year-old Arthur Dale Smothers, a black man, and 16-year-old Kathleen Mikula, his white girlfriend, another interracial couple. Shot them from a wooded area near a railroad overpass. Arthur and Kathleen were walking across a bridge into downtown Johnstown, uh, Pennsylvania, a little over an hour east of Pittsburgh, and they were hit by five bullets. Kathy died within three hours of surgery. Arthur lived two more hours. Civic leaders worked to avert the flood of anger that they feared might lead to more killing. Few people believed the police's statements that the murders were not necessarily racially motivated. For the most part, people in town accepted this couple's relationship. But a few weeks earlier, they had been accosted by a group of white people. And six weeks earlier, Arthur was assaulted by two white men with a fucking stick. Someone had also slashed Arthur's tires and put sugar in his gas tank. All that just for interracial dating. And not in 1950 or 1910 or 1860. The shit went down in 1980. Arthur and Kathy had taken just a few steps onto the bridge. Arthur shot in the back. Bullet went through his chest. Also hitting the groin and right ankle. Kathy hitting the right side in the back. Unfortunately, a thunderstorm passing through the area just following them being shot washed away a lot of the evidence, but police still found four 35 caliber cartridges and two words written in some nearby dirt, white trash. Some witnesses also reported seeing a car driving up a seldom used steep and rutted road that winds up the hillside from the street before the shootings. Joseph was driving a dark green Chevy Nova at that time. Other witnesses saw a similar looking car, uh, you know, driving from this road after the shootings. Police also found fingerprints on a fast food cup near the sniper spot. Larry McCoola, Kathleen's brother, said that they were never told if the prince belonged to Franklin or not. He was in the area that day to rob a bank. Despite this evidence, Joseph would not confess to the Smothers and McCoola murders uh, for almost 20 years, not until 1998. Although there was some evidence against him, like fitting the profile, there was never enough to make an arrest. The confession was obtained by Cambria County ADA Kelly Callahan and Johnstown Detective Janine Guidos in Tennessee, two attractive white women. Right, His favorite people, the kind of people Jimmy Joe enjoyed confessing to the most. Kelly Callahan later said about the interview, it was eerie. I don't think I'll ever experience that again. It was literally like you could get into the mind of a serial killer. Cambria County chose not to prosecute him for the murders because, like I mentioned before, the risk of moving him was too high and he already had a death sentence against him, according to Callahan. Uh, by the summer of 1980, Franklin was killing more frequently than ever. And on June 25th, a mere 10 days following his previous murders, he now kills two more white women, 19-year-old Nancy Santamero, and 26-year-old Vicki Durian in Pocahontas County, West Virginia. The two girls were out hitchhiking on the way to something called a rainbow gathering. Their unsolved murders would become known as the Rainbow Murders. The women had left their Iowa City home, heading for a rainbow gathering of the Rainbow family in Monongah Monongahela National Forest, West Virginia. And uh, what the hell is the Rainbow family, you might be wondering, uh, per the website for a 2022 gathering in Colorado. Some say we're the largest non-organization of non-members in the world. We have no leaders and no organization. To be honest, the Rainbow Family means different things to different people. Many of our traditions are based on Native American traditions, and we have a strong orientation to take care of the earth. 
We gather in the National Forest yearly to pray for peace, celebrate our inter- our interdependence, and share food, knowledge, music, and inspiration. Probably quite a, quite a bit of drugs. Uh, we gather to celebrate life, love, freedom, and our own interconnectedness with the spiritual universe, with the natural environment, and with each other. Even though many of us are capable of surviving everywhere on our own, we come together to celebrate the joy that comes from being with others and sharing love, wisdom, ideas, dance, yoga, theater, acoustic music, and drumming, probably a fucking ton of drugs, all without electricity and usually in a remote national forest where our cell phones don't get any signal, freeing us to actually be here now with ourselves, our friends, and new interesting people we may only chat or dance with for a moment or who may become lifelong friends. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'd probably go. Uh, these gatherings began back in 1972. They used to uh, hold some near where I grew up in Riggins, Idaho. Pop Ward hated them. <laughs> he thought they were a bunch of dirty hippies uh, who gathered in the woods mostly to do drugs and have sex. And he was not wrong. But that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, they've also sadly become notorious for leaving a bunch of trash all over the forest when they leave, even though the, they're supposed to be there to celebrate the earth. Uh, the group's original idea, uh, or ideal has become hijacked. It seems by a lot of people just wanting to fuck around and get high and people could care less about community or the environment. It reminds me of burning man. Uh, Joseph will later in 1984 confess to this crime during the investigation of another case. He said he picked, uh, them up because they were attractive, but then killed them after one of the girls said she had a black boyfriend. Yep. That tracks. A local West Virginia man named Jacob Beard will be falsely convicted of these murders. Despite Franklin's confession in June of 1993, in 1999, the trial judge will review Joseph Franklin's confessions and order a new trial. And then on May 31st, 2000, Jacob Beard will be found not guilty of the murders. And then we'll get a a $2 million settlement in a wrongful conviction suit. I bet he would trade it, uh, give that money back to get seven years of his life back. Uh, Less than a month later, Jimmy Joe kills again. Again, he kills a pair of victims. August 20th, 1980, 10 days after arriving in Salt Lake City, Utah. Joseph killed 20-year-old Ted Fields and 18-year-old David Martin. The two young black men had been out jogging at Liberty Park just outside of downtown Salt Lake City. Beautiful park, actually. With two young white women. And they were leaving the park, or as they were leaving the park, seven shots rang out and the men were hit multiple times uh, from roughly 40 yards away. Joseph's car at this time, a 1975 Chevy Camaro with a Kentucky license plate was seen leaving the scene. Joseph shot and somebody did get the license plate. Thank God. Joseph shot at Ted and David from tall weeds in a vacant lot. He had seen them jogging with two white girls in a park. He said, I intended to shoot an interracial couple coming out of a convenience store. Then I saw two interracial couples jogging through Liberty Park. I swung the rifle around real quick to my left. I was able to get a shot off real quick and drop one of the blacks. My God. Uh, Franklin said he was shocked that instead of running away, the group now grabbed the man's arms, tried to pull him away. How, cr- how crazy. They would try and save their friend's life. He said, I couldn't understand that. You know, in a way, I get it. I highly doubt Jimmy Joe uh, ever had anyone who did that for him. He then shot the second black man saying, I then emptied the gun into both guys while they were lying there. I figured I should complete the job. God, this guy's such a piece of shit. Uh, one of the girls who was there, Terry Mitchell, was left with a scar from a bullet that went through one of the men, ricocheted off the pavement. She'll later say that she forgave Franklin, but still wanted him to be executed, to put him out of his lifetime of suffering. Uh, 10 days before he, was fi- he finally was executed, she sent him two books about uh, spiritual healing and forgiveness and agreed to talk to him over the phone. Mitchell said, he said he was glad he didn't kill me. He said he was sorry for the incident. The incident is what he called what he did. Joseph called her two days before he died. He sounded scared and seemed afraid of dying. Uh, Good. Yeah, I hope he was scared. I hope he was terrified. Excuse me. Uh, Mitchell said in her interview, he, has, he is as remorseful as he is capable of being. He said he is so grateful he didn't kill me and that he was mentally ill when he did it. I have made peace with that information. Uh, Joseph also told her that he experienced incredible neglect and abuse during his childhood, but nothing he said changed her mind about his execution. Uh, Despite witnesses getting a good look at him in his car, that motherfucker is still uh, roaming around out there. However, following shooting those two young men in the park, Joseph Franklin will finally be arrested in Kentucky on September 25th, 1980, just over a month after these park murders. And the way he got arrested is so random, so ridiculous. Police were not looking for him. Not what I expected. And very avoidable on Jimmy Joe's part. I love these weird little moments in these stories. At 2.10 a.m. that day, police in Florence, Kentucky, part of the Cincinnati metro area, they receive a report of a robbery at a gas station. The attendant described a getaway vehicle as a silver and maroon 1975 Chrysler with Indiana plates. The car was found across the road at the Scottish Inn. It was registered not to Jimmy Joe, but to 19-year-old Gary R. Kirk. And Kirk was arrested on suspicion of robbery. Jimmy Joe just happened to be staying in the motel room next door to Gary Kirk. 
And when the cops came to arrest Kirk, fucking Jimmy, <laughs> this is outrageous. Fucking Jimmy Joe called the motel front desk and complained about all the noise that the cops were making, that they were keeping him up. <laughs> then when the motel clerk told him there wasn't shit he could do about it, it's fucking cops. He now calls the Florence Police Department and that arrogant moron complains to dispatch. He claimed that one that, that uh, Kirk's Chrysler was blocking his car. Now he couldn't leave. He was trapped and he couldn't sleep because of all the noise. Dispatch tells him they'll see what he can do, what they can do. But then nothing happens. And Jimmy Joe gets more annoyed. And then when the car still hasn't moved after a little while and there's still police out there making noise, this fucking idiot goes full Karen, calls back dispatch, demands essentially to speak to the manager. <laughs> I love it so much. Eventually, the chief of police gets on the phone and explains to this fucking idiot that they can't move the car. They're investigating a robbery. It's going to take a little time. And then this gets better. As Officer Dennis Collins, an officer uh, at the motel investigating the robbery, was getting ready to leave the scene, the motel clerk tells him about this crazy man in the room next door to the suspect who won't stop calling him and complaining. Officer Collins now agrees to go to Franklin's room and talk to him about Gary Kirk's car. Hey, dude, fucking calm down. We're going to move the car soon. You know? <laughs> and then as, as he now uh, walks over to the room, he looks at Franklin's Camaro parked outside his room and he sees a revolver just laying openly on the front seat. And he gets a bad feeling in his gut about this hothead with the fucking revolver laying on the seat who won't shut the fuck up about the crime scene. So he calls in this guy's license plate number for a check, finds out that the car matches the description of a vehicle connected to a double homicide in Salt Lake City. And Franklin, when he talks to him, matches the description of the alleged shooter. Shooter, this moron. Backup is now called in and a team of officers arrest Joseph Franklin in his room. How random is that? After getting away with murder after murder for three years, Jimmy Joe basically arrests himself. He doesn't think about how maybe he should hide his gun before going full Karen on the police, especially since he's killed a lot of people over the last three years. For a guy who's been so good at evading law enforcement, this was quite the mistake. However, in a criminal sense, uh, Jimmy Joe will quickly redeem himself. Within an hour of his arrest, he escapes. A lot of weird shit going on this day. Uh, he sneaks out a window in an interrogation room in Florence when an officer steps outside for a few moments. <laughs> what if that guy got fired? They don't say. Uh, and then he was just gone. He just split quick. Police later uh, that morning will bring out bloodhounds, search the local woods, they'll go door to door, hand out flyers, put the word out via local news, local radio. Nada. He's a ghost. Uh, he's also still making dumb choices, though. So shortly after his escape, he calls his ex-wife, Anita Cooper. And he mentions that he's uh, heading out to Florida. He's going to sell his blood, make some extra cash. Now the FBI gets word out to blood bank centers uh, all across the nation, but especially in Florida. And they pass a flyer out with Joseph's picture and description of these places. Uh, the, they use that FBI profile, Agent Douglas and his team put together, and they will catch him again. Just a month after escaping from a police precinct, Joseph Franklin is arrested October 28th, 1980 in Lakeland, Florida. Special FBI agent Fernando Rivero was going uh, around to different blood banks and plasma donation facilities in Central Florida. And he had uh, given a wanted flyer of Joseph to a lot of places, including Saratech Biologicals. Later that day, Saratech, uh, the receptionist, uh, named Claudette Mallard. She's a man matching Joseph's description entered the building. Said his name was Thomas Alvin Bonnard. Two technicians see a Grim Reaper tattoo on his right forearm and an American Eagle tattoo on the left. Uh, they went into the manager's office and informed him that Thomas matched the description of Joseph Paul Franklin. Manager calls the FBI. Agent Bruce Dando told him to keep Franklin there. Franklin was told to rest for about 50 minutes after having his blood drawn. And he asked, what if I refuse to stay? Well, luckily he did stay. Dando called the Lakeland PD, then the FBI and Lakeland detectives meet outside, wait for Joseph to leave, and arrest him outside the clinic. This time, no one will let the slippery fucker out of their sight. Three weeks later, November 17th, 1980, Joseph is arraigned on federal charges in Salt Lake City for the murders of David Martin and Ted Fields. Also accused of three bank robberies, various weapons violations, flight to avoid prosecution for his Kentucky escape, and wanted for question about the Larry Flint and Vernon Jordan shootings. Following spring, March 4th, 1981, Joseph Franklin is found guilty uh, of two federal civil rights charges in Utah. I thought this was pretty brilliant. He was convicted of denying Fields and Martin their civil rights by killing them and thus preventing them from using the public park due to their race. March 23rd, 1981, Joseph is sentenced to two life terms for this conviction. After receiving his sentence, he calls the judge a communist agent and a bastard, tries to attack him in the courtroom, also leapt at the prosecutors, called the conviction a farce. Six months later, September 19th, 1981, Joseph now convicted of two counts of first-degree murder for the same killings. 
During a recess in a sentencing phase, uh, Franklin does briefly escape. He's free, uh, albeit uh, still in the building for 15 minutes, snuck into a key operated elevator, linking the Metropolitan Hall of Justice to the county jail through a basement tunnel. He had somehow stolen a screwdriver, pried open the control panel outside the elevator door, hot wired the controls with a dime and a paperclip like he's fucking MacGyver, then took the elevator two floors down to another holding area where he uh, was found after a frantic search by a jailhouse guard. This guy was a piece of shit, but not a dummy. After a sentencing, his sister Marilyn will say it's a shame he didn't make it. Uh, on September 23rd, 1981, a jury can't agree on sending him to a firing squad, so he's given two more life sentences. So he gets four life sentences for the two Salt Lake City murders now. One, two of them from the state, two of them from the feds. A uh, weird tragic footnote to this first trial of his, though, Terry Mitchell, one of the white girls jogging with the two men who was killed. She was just 16 when this happened. She was a star witness for the prosecution. And in 2017, over 35 years later, she will sue the federal prosecutor, Richard Warren Roberts, another dick, true dick in this case, uh, in Franklin's first trial for raping her numerous times during the trial. He won't deny they had sex, just a matter of consent. She said he took her to a hotel room after coaching her about uh, how to behave on the witness stand and then forced himself on her while he watched himself on the news being interviewed about the case and then told her that if she told anyone, it would jeopardize the entire trial and the man who killed her friends would go free. The fuck is wrong with so many people? Now for some good news. Uh, Jimmy Joe's a racist lone wolf. Can't even get along. Uh, this is racist lone wolf. He can't even get along with other white supremacists. Uh, that does not do him any favors in prison. This mentality. And on February 3rd, 1982, he is stabbed 15 times by a group of black inmates. He had just arrived at a federal prison in Marion, Illinois, three days earlier. Sadly, he will survive the attack. But they, they got some good shots on him. Later that same year, on August 17th, 1982, he's acquitted by a federal jury of the Vernon Jordan shooting, a crime he will admit that he did commit years later. Prosecution had motel employees testify and introduce registration cards allegedly signed by Franklin. Three inmates testified that Joseph told them about shooting the black man. But Joseph didn't, of course, call him a black man. In Indiana, his defense argued that the government was desperate to solve the case and picked on Franklin notorious for his racist views as a convenience. During his trial, Joseph admitted that he hated black people and racial mixing, but denied being in Fort Wayne. 1983, he confessed to shooting Larry Flint. He was indicted, but never tried. Since, as I said before, he was never leaving prison anyway, and this crime would never lead to a death penalty. The following year, March 7th, 1984, Joseph Paul Franklin indicted for the bombing of the Chattanooga Synagogue, where the building was destroyed, but no one was harmed. The indictment was announced when prosecutors from Georgia and Wisconsin and a Justice Department official disclosed that Franklin was suspected in at least 13 homicides in seven states. Douglas Fisher, spokesman for the Chattanooga police, said that Franklin confessed to the bombing, said he went to Chattanooga specifically to, quote, kill Jews, said he'd hoped to kill members of the congregation. The day before, March 6, Gwinnett County, Georgia, District Attorney Brian Huff said he planned to seek an indictment against Franklin for the Larry Flint shooting after the police tied up loose ends. Uh, Huff said that Franklin wrote to the Gwinnett police chief in August uh, 1983 from his cell asked to talk with someone from your department Huff said that he suspected that Franklin would admit to his involvement in the Larry Flint shooting because he would have to better uh, he would have a better chance of escaping if he was sent to Georgia for trial but again I already referenced that uh, they weren't going to try him because of the escape risk March 7th Dane County Wisconsin DA Hal Harlow said it was likely that Franklin would be prosecuted for the murders of Alphonse Manny Jr. and Tor Tony Schwinn the interracial couple he shot and killed after his car after their car momentarily blocked Franklin from leaving a mall parking lot. June 13th, 1984, Joseph Franklin confesses to the Chattanooga Synagogue bombing. Man, so many crimes in so many places. Took a lot of restructuring on this episode. He can make sure the tracking was right on all this. Uh, four days later, July 17th, Joseph convicted of the Beth Shalom bombing in Chattanooga and receives a 31-year sentence. Two years later, February 14th, 1986, Joseph convicted of the first-degree murders of Alphonse Manning and Tony Schwen in Dane County, Wisconsin, given another life sentence. Uh, he represented himself, showed no emotion when he heard the verdict, and declined to make a comment. Dane County DA Hal Harlow said, I'm opposed to capital punishment, but Mr. Franklin put those beliefs to a sore test. Mr. Franklin is a pathetic creature who will be dangerous until the day he dies. The trial lasted five days. In his closing arguments, Hal Harlow described the murders as the closest thing to killing for sport, which I mentioned before, he had ever seen. Joseph's confession uh, also presented at trial. He confessed to the murders the year prior, 1984 said he came to Madison to kill a former judge, Archie Simonson, because of Simonson's ruling in a sexual assault case. Simonson testified he was criticized for being too lenient in his sentencing of two black men who sexually assaulted a white woman. Despite previously confessing, Franklin denied killing the couple in his closing arguments uh, and denied being in Wisconsin. 
said in the past that he lied in the confession uh, to get out of prison in Illinois and to move into Wisconsin. Said, I did not kill Alphonse Manning and Tony Schwinn. I did not come to Wisconsin to kill Judge Archie Simonson. He described a life sentence as the next best thing to being dead. And asked the jury, would you sentence a loved one, a son, a daughter, a wife, or a husband based on the evidence? I would imagine this is all a game to him, right? He just wants to see how many times he can beat the system, maybe. Win or lose, right? He's still never walking free. Jumping ahead almost a decade now, in 1994, Frank confessed to Gerald Gordon's 1977 murder that had now went unsolved for almost 20 years. Franklin claimed he was instructed to confess in a dream. He would say, I was always having dreams on the streets telling me to do things. I always felt there were messages from God, so I would obey them. Eh, is he telling the truth here? Or is he working some new angle, trying to get sent to a psychiatric treatment facility where he'd have a better chance of escaping? November 9th, after confessing to federal agents, Joseph is charged with capital murder in Gerald's murder, two counts of first-degree assault for wounding two others, and three counts of armed criminal action after he confessed to the Richmond Heights Brith Shalom Knesset Israel Congregation Synagogue shooting. He confessed that he planned to kill as many Jewish people as possible that day. He picked Brith Shalom uh, randomly after he visited other synagogues in the area. He said he confessed because he wanted to clear his conscience. Eh. June of 1995, while awaiting trial in St. Louis, Joseph now confesses to the Vernon Jordan shooting. He said simply, I will say that I did it. The following year, in 1996, after more than six hours of interviews, Dr. Dorothy Lewis, a psychiatrist from New York, concludes that Franklin has paranoid schizophrenia and was a psychotic whose thinking was delusional and confused. Lewis will later review her records again in 2003 and 2013 and come to the same conclusion. She also reviewed reports and interviews with Franklin's family. His lawyers will cite her conclusions in their petition to the governor to ask for a commutation uh, or reprieve of a death sentence that's still coming for him. The petition said, Dr. Lewis finds Mr. Franklin to be a chronically paranoid schizophrenic person who suffers psychotic behaviors, such as blasphemous thoughts, auditory hallucinations, and delusional beliefs, such as the belief that he is a Nazi and a Jew. So he's Jewish now. Did he really believe that, or is he just playing mind games? The petition noted that Franklin had been this way since he was an adolescent. Joseph Franklin and his siblings were beaten by their parents, and according to Franklin's older sister, Carolyn, Joseph always got the worst of it. Joseph would later say in a 2013 interview with the Chattanooga Times Free Press, I've been diagnosed by Dr. Dorothy Lewis, a psychiatry professor specializing in serial killers, as I think a uh, paranoid schizophrenic, something like that. I would go through these periods, man, where I would just feel for weeks really bad. I just, after being locked up a lot in your childhood and not being able to socialize, you know, having to stay inside and sit on the couch for a good part of your life, you find that you don't have the social skills that other people have. The ability to socialize with other people, it kind of warps your brain. I can't really explain it. But yeah, I've been diagnosed with mental illness by Dorothy Lewis and also by, and then it's inaudible. He diagnosed me with the major case of obsessive compulsive disorder. One of the symptoms of that, you'll actually feel an inner voice telling you to kill people. I don't think that's a, uh, <laughs> always a symptom of OCD. One example was when I was at the federal penitentiary in Marion, Illinois during the eighties, one of the guards was escorting me out to the wreck. He was by himself at the time. This was before lockdown there. We were cuffed. We were cuffed in front and I was walking behind him. I had my hands cuffed and I had a voice tell me to throw my hands over the guard's head and strangle him to death. I immediately rejected that thought because I liked the guard. He was a good guy. That's one case I specifically remember. Well, I should be a fucking serial killer then. Uh, if you just can't, if you're going to blame it on these kind of thoughts. <laughs> I think about killing people on a regular basis. <laughs> I'm like, ah, guy's a piece of shit. We'll be better off without him. But I don't do it. Uh, also, in 1996, Joseph Franklin confessed to these uh, to those two West Virginia murders. The young women headed to that rainbow gathering. Uh, he confessed to Deborah Dixon, reporting on the case uh, for WKRC TV. Deborah, who worked for WKRC TV for 44 years before retiring in 2018, another white, attractive woman. Did he think confessing to unsolved murders uh, to these unsolved murders would impress these women that they'd maybe want to visit him in prison and, and fuck him or something? January 30th, 1997, Joseph Paul Franklin convicted in Missouri now of capital murder for that murder of Gerald Gordon and two counts of first degree assault. And the jury recommends the death penalty. So now he finally gets the death penalty. Joseph Franklin re represented himself at this trial and actually asked the jury to sentence him to death. When the jury voted for the death penalty, Franklin gave them two thumbs up. <laughs> That's actually kind of funny. I wish that happened more often. We, the jury, sentence the defendant to death. And then the guy's just like, oh, yeah, 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 oh, fuck yeah, bro. Mama, I'm coming home. Just gets all excited and happy. February 27th, Jimmy Joe now sentenced to death. Uh, yeah, murder of Gerald Gordon officially. Joseph claimed he would uh, kill again if the jury did not have him executed. Joseph told the Post-Dispatch he preferred the firing squad, but he was sentenced to death in Missouri, a lethal injection state. Also claimed he would not try to ever fight his death sentence. 
even said it disgusts me that these guys try to save their miserable lives. Ah, however, he would end up fighting a lot for his life. They almost always do when the time gets close. Franklin represented himself at the uh, Missouri trial. As I said, he struck women from the jury because he said they were compassionate. And in Utah, women on the jury had voted for life in prison instead of the death penalty. And that pissed him off. Uh, Joseph Franklin, excuse me, also told the paper that he believed that the way to get rid of evil in the world was to abort all the male babies. Keep this up until the population is about 80% female. Most evil comes from males. Uh, yeah, he's not totally wrong there. Why do we cover so many more guys than gals when it comes to episodes on dirt bags like serial killers, serial rapists, cult leaders? For the same reason every other true, pri- true crime podcast uh, I've ever come across does. Dudes are the ones doing the overwhelming majority of this shit. According to a 2000 study by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, men account worldwide for about 98% of all homicide perpetrators. And I could go on and on with more stats, but I doubt any of you are like, I don't know. That doesn't sound right. Lucifina tells me it's obvious. February 28th, 1997, the Falls Church Police announced that Joseph was a suspect in the murder of Raymond Turner, that Burger King manager he shot dead. Joseph had specific knowledge of the crime, according to one detective. Uh, He had just admitted to the murder in that interview with Janet Tomorrow from Inside Edition I mentioned earlier. October 21st, 1998, Joseph is now convicted of the murders of those two children, 14-year-old Daryl Lane and 13-year-old Dante Evans-Brown in Cincinnati, Ohio. The defense presented no witnesses. The prosecution presented a taped confession. Joseph Franklin confessed to the Cincinnati murders the previous year in 1997 while on death row in Missouri. Again, an attractive white woman was the reason he confessed. According to Cincinnati ABC local news affiliate, WCPO, Joseph considered himself a ladies' man. So prosecutor Joe Dieters sent a pretty young assistant prosecutor, Melissa Powers, to interview Franklin in prison. Prosecutor Dieters uh, knew that Joseph loved to talk to female reporters, investigators, and prosecutors. Melissa Powers was perfect. She studied Franklin, buttered him up by sending some letters to him before the interview that were a bit flirtatious. Uh, Franklin was so into her, he almost gave his confession before she turned on the tape recorder. Powers said after the interview, I sold my soul to the devil in order to get what we needed. Powers described the interview as traumatic and said, I was face to face with somebody very dangerous that was capable of killing without any kind of conscience or remorse. She said she was scared, but I didn't want to show it and blow this opportunity that Cincinnati may get in order to bring closure to the families. I flattered him a lot. I made him feel that he was important. Asked for his assistance. Definitely played up the compliments and the flattery. Franklin said the following in his confession video. I just put the gun on the biggest dude first and I fired one shot with that 44 Magnum. And so I just heard somebody go, make a sound like they had just gotten shot. The other guy bolted. It was just like through a miracle that I got him. I did not even aim the gun at him. I just shot in the dark, hoping I would get a lucky shot. And sure enough, I hit him. When asked why he shot them, he said, I was trying to get rid of all the ugly people in the world. And I considered blacks the ugliest people of all. Again, he's, he's talking about children here. Biggest dude? Yeah, he was 14. Jury took a whole 45 minutes to convict him of two counts of aggravated murder. At one point, Joseph said in court, Your Honor, I didn't even have to confess to this in the first place. I helped these people out solving this case. I could not have done that. I should at least get credit for that. And the judge, Hamilton County Common Pleas Judge, Ralph Winkler responded, Throughout this case, you've whined all the way. If there was such a thing as a motion to whine, I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure you would have filed it. Motion to whine. I like that, Judge. October 22nd, 1998, Joseph Franklin was sentenced to 40 years to life in prison for the Cincinnati murders. Judge Winkler also told him, I look at you and I see the face of evil. August 14th, 2013, the Missouri State Supreme Court ordered that Joseph Franklin be executed by lethal injection on November 20th. Franklin had now been convicted of eight total murders in Ohio, Tennessee, Utah, Wisconsin, and Missouri. He'd also confessed to or was implicated in 13 additional murders and confessed to the attempted murders of Larry Flint and Vernon Jordan. That's not even counting all the fucking bank robberies and everything. And just like catching this guy was complicated, so we'll be executing him. Some interesting history here, illustrating how tremendously complicated carrying out a state-ordered execution can be. Initially, both Joseph Franklin and another death row inmate named Alan Nicholson were supposed to be executed with the drug propofol. Nicholson, uh, Nicholson, excuse me, had murdered a man named Richard Drummond in 1994. So many dicks. Dick Drummond. Dick Drummer. Uh, That guy clearly didn't have the easiest life with a name like that. Now he gets killed. The murder was labeled as a good Samaritan killing. Drummond had offered him a ride after his car broke down on the interstate following a robbery he committed with two other men. And Nicholson stole his car at gunpoint, loaded stolen goods into it, then worried about the man ratting him out, took him out into the woods and shot him. 
One of the two other men, Nicholson's associate, Dennis Skillicorn, had already been executed in 2009 for the murder of Richard Drummond. And now a guy named Richard Dieter. Yes, Dick Dieter. Dick Drummer and Dick Dieter. What a world. Dick Dieter was the ex- uh, ex- executive director, excuse me, of the Death Penalty Information Center. And he said that there was concern about the use of the drug propofol because the state of Missouri no longer required a physician on the execution team. Propofol is usually administered by a physician or a nurse, uh, anesthe- anesthesist, anesthes. oh my God. It's not anesthesiologist. I know how to say that word. And uh, who fucking knows? A-N-E-S-T-H-E-T-I-S-T. I can't figure out how to say that word right now. Anesthesist. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, who was supervised by a physician. And if the drug was administered improperly, it could cause an inmate to suffer a little bit before they're executed. You can't have that. Dieter said about the decision, this is an experiment with a human subject. This will be a sort of brute force approach where you give them enough and they die. Okay. Uh, Also, is it really wrong to experiment with a guy like Joseph Paul Franklin? I don't think so. Like for this level of guilty, do we really have to worry about cruel and unusual punishment? October 11, 2013, Missouri Governor Jay Nixon postpones the execution of an inmate uh, that would be executed with propofol, propofol, because now the European Union is threatening to limit to limit export of propofol if it gets used by uh, or in the Allen Nicholson execution, which would potentially cause a nationwide shortage for hospitals and surgical centers nationwide. So Governor Nixon issues a stay execution and the Missouri DOC revises their execution protocol. Uh, propofol is the most widely used anesthetic <laughs> anesthetic. There we go. Fucking boom. Anesthetic. <laughs> she was an anest- anesthetist. God damn it. In the U.S. and 90% of it comes from Europe. So getting the supply significantly reduced uh, would have wreaked havoc on the American medical system. Uh, system. And the EU is and was the death penalty uh, is, is and was the, is, is and was against. Words are fucking tricky today for some reason. Uh, the EU is and was against the death penalty. What if I talk like this the whole time? I wouldn't be able to talk very long, but I pronounce really crystal clear. And uh, they have legislation that prevents the export of certain chemicals for capital punishment. And now in 2013, the EU is considering adding propofol to the list of these chemicals, but that would have greatly reduced the amount available in the U.S. and would hurt both pharmaceutical profits and European and U.S. relations. Uh, the German manufacturer of the drug, oh boy, Frazinus, Frazinus Copy, had begun to require all U.S. distributors to sign a contract promising they wouldn't sell the drug to any departments of corrections. But around 2012, one of the suppliers accidentally, for legal reasons, had to say that, sent a container to Missouri. The supplier emailed the state, asked them to give it back. The state did not give it back. They kept it for 11 months. But then on October 9th, because of all this mess, thanks to the ACLU uh, making an open record request, they do return it to the supplier. Missouri now said they would still proceed with the executions, but would just use U.S. manufactured propofol. But then there were problems with that. So complicated. Department of Corrections documents obtained by the ACLU showed that Missouri bought 100 vials of propofol in June of 2013 from Hospira, the only U.S. manufacturer at that time. But then when asked if they knew Missouri was going to use the drug for an execution, a company spokesperson responded, we have been provided information suggesting that the state of Missouri has a supply of Hospira propofol and that the state purchased it from an unauthorized distributor. And that distributor was Mercer Medical. In April of 2013, a sales rep had emailed the Missouri DOC to convince him to use Mercer Medical as a vendor. The DOC bought the propofol from Mercer a few months later. Then, returning now to October 11th, 2013, when uh, Missouri Governor Jay Nixon ordered a stay of execution, he also ordered the Missouri DOC to find a new drug for executions because he was tired of this propofol mess. I'm sure privately he was like, why is it so fucking hard to kill this motherfucker? This dickhead didn't have to jump through any hoops when he decided to pull the trigger over and over and over. Week later, the DOC now proposed uh, pentabarbital. Pentabarbital. Fun words. Uh, a sedative traditionally used by vets to euthanize animals. The DOC also changed the rules so they could hide the identity of the supplier by adding them to the execution team. Uh, the ACLU sued, arguing that this change took away public oversight of the process. I get the importance of not setting the wrong precedent with all this, but also so much time and effort and money being spent to keep two sociopaths alive. In the state of Missouri, a pharmacist needs a prescription for a specific patient for a legitimate medical use to dispense pentabarbital. Many question it, uh, question if using <laughs> pentabarbital for lethal injection qualified as legitimate medical use. A new execution protocol was whipped up now for using 
pentobarbital, and it stated that if the inmate does not die after the first dose, the DOC should take out a 32-ounce framing hammer with a waffle head and sw- uh, swing it, uh, you know, by a grown man, have it swung by a grown man, uh, in- into the, you know, person to be executed skull, and it should never take more than three good whacks to flatline that motherfucker. No one survives the hammer. That's an exact quote from the DOC. Now, they said that if an inmate does not die after the first dose, they just administer another syringe, but only after a sufficient amount of time for death to occur. Okay, sounds good. Death row inmates, though, now argue that using untested drugs is cruel and unusual punishment. Took a lot of hypocritical balls for most of these inmates to make that argument. Several inmates filed federal lawsuits to delay their executions until the protocols were reviewed. Even Joseph Franklin, uh, Paul Franklin's uh, shooting victim, Hustler publisher Larry Flint spoke out against the execution of Joseph and worked with the ACLU to stop it now, which is surprising. Larry Flint wrote an article about his decision for The Hollywood Reporter published on October 17, 2013 said, on March 6, 1978, as I stood on the steps of the Georgia courthouse where I was fighting obscenity charges, a series of gunshots rang out. I remember nothing that happened after that until I woke up in the intensive care unit. The damage to my central nervous system was severe, and it took several weeks before doctors could stabilize me. From then on, I was paralyzed from the waist down and have been confined to a wheelchair ever since. In all the years since the shooting, I would have, I have never come face to face with Franklin. I would love an hour in a room with him and a pair of wire, and a pair of wire cutters and pliers so I can inflict the same damage on him that he inflicted on me. But I do not want to kill him, nor do I want to see him die. As far as the severity of punishment is concerned to me, a life spent in a three by six foot cell is far harsher than the quick release of a lethal injection. And cost to the taxpayer, execution has been proven to be far more expensive for the state than a conviction of life without parole due to the long and complex judicial process required for capital cases, as we're seeing. As I see it, the sole motivating factor behind the death penalty is vengeance not justice, and I firmly believe that a government that forbids killing among its citizens should not be in the business of killing people itself. Not a bad argument. I still like knowing that these guys are dead, though, and that there's literally a 0% chance that they they will ever get out and hurt anyone again. Uh, But he does make a very intelligent argument. I do get it. Random quick trivia about Larry Flint. Uh, Dude did not just publish Hustler, Hustler. He was a hustler. In early 1965, when he was just 22, Flint took $1,800 from his savings approximately 18000 a day when adjusted for inflation, bought his mother's bar in Dayton, Ohio, called the Kiwi, refitted it, soon was making 1000 bucks a week, about 10000 uh in today's dollars, uh, used the profits to quickly buy two other bars, worked as many as 20 hours a day, had to take amphetamines to stay awake, used the profits from his three bars to open a new bar called the Hustler Club that featured nude hostess dancers, and then he got fucking super rich. Uh, back to this legal battle over what drug should be legally allowed to end a death row inmate's life. October 22nd, 2013, the Missouri DOC announces that despite the protests, despite all the lawsuits, they had adopted a single drug policy for executions and the state would use pentobarbital instead of propofol. But the ACLU, not done. November 9th, the ACLU of Missouri files a motion on Larry Flint's behalf to unseal documents regarding the executions. The organization seeking to learn the identity of the anesthesiologists uh, who would perform Franklin's execution. The filing stated Flynn has learned about the secrecy shrouding Missouri's execution process. This includes recent revelations that Missouri appears to have used unsavory methods to secure and maintain execution drugs and tried to hide that and other information from the public. The motion also noted that the DOC said their doctor was certified by the American Board of Anesthesiology, but that the organization has a rule that states that a member should not participate in an execution. Flint now argued that the doctor helping with the execution was either lying about being board certified or lacks the professional standing required to maintain certification. How crazy uh, that is. He's working so hard, spending so much of his own money, I imagine, to keep a guy who put a bullet in his spine and paralyzed him from the waist down alive. Also, weird spot to be in for a medical professional uh, if they did, in fact, swear to not take part in an execution. Should medical professional organizations be allowed to state that their members can't be part of an execution if the nation their organization exists in does, in fact, condone executions? Very uh, odd legal and moral territory waiting in there. So why wasn't the identity of the execution anesthesiologist made public? Well, because back in 2005, a federal judge had halted Missouri's use of the death penalty because the surgeon in charge testified that he had dyslexia, occasionally confused numbers, and didn't follow follow written procedures. Ah, I love that the guy straight up just testified. Yeah, I get numbers wrong. I just kind of wing it a lot of times. Imagine that doctor working on you. Uh, so how much of that is it going to take to knock me out, Doc? Uh, I don't know. I can't read. 
<laughs> ah, somewhere around, I don't know, this much. Just kind of holds up his fingers. I'll figure it out. I always do. This is, this is my first rodeo. Uh, after this testimony, the state then made it unlawful to re- reveal the identities of the execution team. Despite the efforts of the ACLU, it was looking more and more like Franklin's execution date on November 20th, not going to change. Uh, Joseph Franklin would give several interviews during the final days of his life. We've gone over excerpts from some of them. During the last three weeks of his life, he did a series of phone interviews with the Intelligence Report, the Southern Poverty Law Center's magazine. Excuse me. And he told the news outlet, I was mentally ill when I was out there, man. I mean, I was just completely out of control, to be quite honest. That was not me out there in the streets doing that crap. I would never even think of doing that stuff again. If he was so mentally ill, so out of control, how was he so good at avoiding capture? He also said, I I just had totally been obsessed with Mein Kampf and Hitler and wanted to kill some Jews. That was another thing that was crazy. That was obviously the work of somebody who was mentally ill because who would want to go around shooting somebody worshiping at a synagogue? I just cannot imagine myself committing a crime like that anymore. I've actually come to the conclusion over the years, a person that is anti-Semitic, that in and itself is a sign of mental illness. Okay, he's probably bullshitting here and being manipulative, but I do like that sentiment, right? Being a diehard racist, I don't know if that's a sign of mental illness, but it's definitely a sign of a, a real ignorant, defective way of thinking since there's no rational, logical basis for racism. Uh, Joseph said that he cured himself of his mental illness by meditating and reading while in solitary confinement, saying it's called bibliotherapy. Franklin spent most of three decades in solitary confinement. He had to do so for his own safety after that time in 1982 when he got stabbed 15 times by a group of black inmates. He, you know, he, he would not be well, uh, well received <laughs> by black inmates in general the entirety of his uh, time in prison. Franklin said in his interview, I still think miscegenation is wrong, but now I know it's none of my business. Huh. So he recognizes that anti-Semitism is a sign of mental illness, but still opposes whites and blacks getting married. Is he, is he saying, or just dating? Is he saying he's still mentally ill? Joseph claimed that because he was abused for years by his mom, he lacked the intelligence and maturity to keep from losing control to his hate. Also claimed that after suffering from years of undernourishment, it delayed his mental development and left him susceptible to wrong ideas. Joseph also talked about his early involvement with hate groups saying, I was convinced that the only good people were in that that organization and anybody not in line with that belief, they were wrong. Just goes to show you how you can be totally convinced that something you believe in is true when nothing can be further from the truth. I agree wholeheartedly with that sentiment. Uh, So many people out there in the world, right? So absolutely certain that their view is right. Everyone else is wrong, but they're terrible people. People who oftentimes employ completely morally reprehensible beliefs were such a tribal species, still so quick to point at the other, blame them for all the world's sins. Uh, Joseph claimed that he no longer hated black or Jewish people saying, I'm pro-Semitic instead of anti-Semitic. He also said that at the St. Louis County Jail, he interacted with a lot of blacks who worked there. And I saw they were people just like us. And one of the good things about blacks, this is his quote, and one of the good things about blacks, they forgive and forget. (laughs) Ah, I think he still has some work to do. Uh, Do they, all of them? Because, you know, they all think the same thing, right? You know, your melanin level totally dictates your beliefs. I bet he was just saying that shit to try to be spared from being executed. Saying that blacks as a group forgive and forget is still very racist. Assigning any general qualities to any race is, in fact, racist. Some black people, I imagine, forgive and forget, and some don't. Some white people forgive and forget, some don't. Personality traits not hardwired to a race and what even is a race, right? Like I said earlier, there is no racial unity. Uh, Franklin also said he changed his mind about Jewish people when he read a book titled How Your Mind Can Keep You Well. He said he learned meditation from the book. One of the chapters featured a discussion between author Roy Masters and his rabbi, which surprised Franklin. He said, I just thought I should continue with it and see what this guy's teaching. Also talked about his remorse for all the murders. To say I have remorse for it would be an understatement. I don't think there are words strong enough to put it in. That was not my true self. I was out of control, out of my mind. It is just not something that I would do or even think about now. Joseph acknowledged that some would argue he was only expressing remorse to save his life, but he said, I ain't that shallow. People who knew me for many years would know I ain't that shallow to come up with something like that. He said he felt like his life should be saved. He said, uh, quote, if the jury had to walk a mile in my shoes, I'm certain they would not come back with a sentence of death. It's humiliating to put a person to death with a drug like that. It's humiliating to put someone like me in the same category as an animal. Eh. Tough shit. Uh, it isn't moral to kill somebody using that type of drug. I don't think it's right. God, he's so full of shit. Actually hearing that quote makes, makes me want to kill him even more. Uh, he made the same argument against giving him a, a life sentence previously. You know, he just didn't want to pay the piper. Just trying to save his own ass. Like almost all these serial killers. 
And he also just keeps acting like he didn't do this stuff. You know, he's not that bad of a person. He was somebody else. That was not my true self. I was different. That was a different person that did that thing. Not, not me. Buddy, you didn't just have a bad day. You did that shit for years. He tried to downplay the time he murdered those two children in Cincinnati. He said of the young victims, Dante and Daryl, they just happened to walk by on the sidewalk, to tell you the truth. I basically set up an ambush for whoever walked by. I had no idea how old they were. I even blamed OCD for what he did. In an interview with the Inquirer, he said, I, I had race on my mind at all times. I was just very impressionable when I was young. I just became obsessed with it. I, I just warped my brain. I actually consider myself a warrior. I felt that as misguided as I was, I felt I was fighting to preserve the white race. Franklin told CNN in one of his final interviews, I felt like I was at war. The survival of the white race was at stake. I consider it my mission, my three-year mission. Same length of time Jesus was on his mission from the time he was 30 to 33. Yeah, he's the same as Jesus. When asked if he thought it was a hero to hate groups, he said, well, that's what they tell me. I'd rather people like me than not like me, like most people. I'd rather be loved than hated. And they're not the only ones who love me though. There are a lot of Jews who love me too. <laughs> now, when asked why Jewish people would love him, he answered, when you commit a, uh, this is maybe the best quote of his. He said, when you commit a crime against a certain group of people, a bonding takes place. It seems like you belong to them. Fucking what? Maybe he really was mentally ill. He was mentally ill. Saying that killing members of a group is a way to endear yourself to that group is insane. By that rationale, Jewish people today should fucking love Hitler more than any other person on earth. No one worked harder to bond with the Jewish people than Hitler and Franklin's reasoning. Uh, November 18th, 2013, two days from Franklin's scheduled execution, Missouri Governor Jay Nixon denies clemency. Now, over the next two days, a flurry of final motions will be made, quickly spiraling up all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. But at 5.20 a.m. on November 20th, the U.S. Supreme Court denies Franklin's stay of execution. He's out of options. Moment's finally at hand. Finally, November 20th, 2013, now 63-year-old Joseph Paul Franklin executed by the state of Missouri for the 1977 murder of Gerald Gordon. He was administered a lethal injection of pentobarbital, and it worked like a champ. He was given a dose at 6.07 a.m. November 20th, 2013, died peacefully 10 minutes later. Felt a lot less pain than most of his victims. I bet. Uh, he refused a final meal and he made no final statement. After all his talk, he died quietly. And that will take us out of today's timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Uh, before we move forward, as I often do at this point in the show, it always seems like a good place to do it. We, we do have another sponsor. Of course, a very, very real one. Time Suck is brought to you today by Jimmy Joe's All White Sandwiches. At Jimmy Joe's, we don't do wheat bread. Like, we do not do it. If you even bring wheat bread or rye, are you kidding me? Dark brown rye bread? You bring wheat or rye into Jimmy Joe's, we'll shoot you. We will literally shoot you. No, Jimmy Joe's has the best all white bread, and that's it. And what will we put in between that bread for your tasty sandwich? Mustard? Yellow mustard? Are you fucking kidding me? You bring in some fucking mustard to Jimmy Joe's, try it. I dare you. I'll literally have you killed. No. You can have white mayonnaise. No veggie, except white onions. What about cheese? You can have cheese. You can have white American cheddar. That's it. But also Swiss, so I guess that's not it. But don't call it Swiss. Call it holy white. You call it Swiss, it sounds like some immigrant shit. Like it might be some kind of secret Jew cheese. You call it Swiss, I fuck, I fucking dare you. I dare you to call it, I'll chew you. You'll be shot. You can have white bread, white mayo, white cheddar, or holy white cheese. Only. You can have chicken or turkey, but only the white meat, that's it. Bring in a turkey drumstick with that fucking greasy brown meat. Bring in a Jimmy Joe's, I dare you. You do that and I'll fucking shoot you. We don't fuck around at Jimmy Joe's. All white sandwiches. Coming during the next two weeks, with every 10 purchases of a Jimmy Joe's delicious Master Race all-white sandwich, I'll give you a coupon for a free haircut at Dick Burt's Hair Salon, where no one gets rushed and everyone gets brushed. Just don't put your Jimmy Joe's all-white is all-right sandwich anywhere near one of Dick Burt's hair brushes. Don't make me tell you why. Come on down. Grab a bite at Jimmy Joe's, unless you're not white or Jewish or dated non-whites or aren't cool with the total annihilation of all non-whites. In that case, stay the fuck out! You're not Jimmy Joe's material! Go choke on a big-ass pile of dark-ass roast beef meat! You fucking commie race traitor, subhuman degenerate! Last thing! Jimmy Joe's not to be confused with Jimmy John's, who've lost their way. They're race traitors. 
They implement zero racial integrity into the fine art of sandwich making. Plus, I find their meat to be quite salty and their sandwiches a little too carb heavy. It's too much bread. Fuck Jimmy John's. Fuck, come to Jimmy Joe's. If you're white. So maybe not a good sponsor. But they pay surprisingly well. Joseph Paul Franklin, a.k.a. James Clayton Vaughn Jr. He would have fucking loved Jimmy Joe's. What a waste of a life. Right? The dude had talent. Imagine if he would have applied the same passion and intensity he put into robbing banks and killing innocent people into a, I don't know, a sandwich shop. He could have for sure been a successful entrepreneur, right? He could, he, could, he could grind. He could have employed numerous people of various races, nourished people of various races, made a bunch of money, raised good kids, good grandkids, but instead, ah, he let his childhood anger cause him to give in to the dark, mindless tribalism side of human nature. He so badly wanted to belong, to feel important, to have a higher purpose in life, and he found that purpose in hate. Of course he did. Hate was almost all he knew. What if he would have had a, a father who remained a part of his life, a good part of his life, someone who loved him, someone who taught him that the color of your skin doesn't matter, but what's in your heart does matter? What if you would have had a, a mom who boosted him up instead of constantly tore him down, someone who made him feel special instead of someone who always made him feel less than? Special shout out this week to all the good parents out there. Adoptive parents, birth parents, step parents, grandparents who have become parents, their grandbabies, guardians and aunts and uncles and family friends who end up in parental roles. Anyone using a good chunk of their time and energy to actively build up and nurture the next generation. One of the most noble and important things you can do in life. If we all parent the next generation to have a good, I take pride in being a contributing member of society work ethic. A solid, not everyone else has to be just like me, empathetic heart. A rational, let's, let's lean on critical thinking more than emotional reactions mind. Uh, let's be guided more the, by kindness and generosity than hatred and selfishness life perspective. How many Joseph Paul Franklins would the next generation have? Maybe none. Maybe absolutely none. No Joseph Franklins, no Charles Mansons, no Adolf Hitlers, or any of the other dirtbags we've covered. Maybe to really have that is nothing more than just a dream, but what a beautiful dream that is. One certainly worth trying to achieve. In the meantime, let's do our best to help law enforcement lock these sick motherfuckers up forever. Time now for today's takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Joseph Paul Franklin was convicted of eight total murders in Ohio, Tennessee, Utah, Wisconsin, and Missouri between 1977 and 1980. And he confessed to or was implicated in 13 additional murders. He also confessed to the attempted murders of both Larry Flint and Vernon Jordan. For three years, he traveled across the country, robbing up to 16 banks for money, donating blood for money, dyeing his hair until it started to fall out, shooting at innocent people. Before he was briefly arrested in Kentucky, no one knew who he was or that all of his many crimes were connected. He was the worst kind of thief of the night. He just targeted lone black people, Jewish people, white women who had dated a black man at one time, interracial couples, killed mothers, fathers, children, a lot of fast food workers, a bunch of young couples in love, and a misguided, sick attempt to start some type of helter-skelter race war. Number two, two of Joseph Franklin's most high-profile victims were Larry Flint, publisher of Hustler Magazine, and civil rights leader Vernon Jordan Jr. Neither man killed, but Larry Flint was left permanently paralyzed from the waist down and suffered a lot of other health problems for the rest of his life. Number three, in 1976, Joseph changed his name from James Clayton Vaughn Jr. to Joseph Paul Franklin. His new name showed his admiration for both Benjamin Franklin, a man who disavowed his racist beliefs later in life, and Nazi leader Joseph Goebbels, who held his super racist beliefs right up until the day he died, right up until he took not just his own life, but also ordered the execution of his children. Number four, Joseph Paul Franklin claimed that he had a change of heart while on death row. In the final weeks of his life, he did several interviews with various news outlets and talked about it, recanted his racist beliefs, kind of. Still don't think black and whites should date. And he expressed remorse for his murders, kind of. He basically kept saying that, uh, you know, the guy that did all the crime was somebody else, not really him. Many believe, including me, that this was mostly just a last-ditch effort to get a stay of execution. And number five, new info. Uh, this entire episode was fucking made up. <laughs> just JK. Uh, no, uh, Joseph Franklin, how mad would you be? Joseph Franklin would end up having a relationship with his daughter, Lori, towards the end of his life. Lori was just one years old when her dad was arrested. Lori told the intelligence report, I knew he was in prison for killing blacks. I didn't know how many. I didn't know any details until I got to be 18. Then I looked it up for myself. Is Lori as racist as her dad was? That's a weird sentence. I knew he was in prison for killing blacks, like they were a different species. Uh, Lori never saw her father in person after his arrest. She always meant to visit him, but said something always came up. She was one of five people allowed to witness the execution, but didn't want to go and said she couldn't afford to if she did want to go. Said that her father tried to write her and call her. 
He sent her money from prison uh, before he was sent to death row in 1997. Lori said, despite him being in prison all the time, he really tried being a dad as best he could. A lot of guys don't even do that, and they're out here. Fair. Uh, Lori said that she loved her dad and was praying for a miracle at the end of his life so he could meet his great-granddaughter. Lori spoke to her dad for the first time in almost two years, a week before his execution. She said her father was becoming too crazy and solitary towards the end of his life, and she needed to keep her distance. When she did speak to him that last time, she said it was the first time she'd ever heard him laugh, and that he apologized for not being a good father to me and asked me to please forgive him. Of course, I said yes. And I'm not sure that I like that he found peace at the end of his life there. It's not like his victims were given that same opportunity. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The one-man race war, Joseph Paul Franklin, has been sucked. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team helping making time suck, such as the Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, running operations, Logan Keith, recording this episode, designing merch for our store at badmagicproductions.com, and to Olivia Lee, providing initial research. Also, thanks to the All Seen Eyes, moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad for making sure Discord keeps running smooth, and everyone over on the Time Sucks subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. Uh, first up today, speaking of good parents, we have a message from one, Rich Lefevre. M- maybe. Sorry, Rich, I'm probably not saying your name right. Rich Lef- Lefevre. Lefevre. Uh, Lefevre. Hey, uh, Rich wrote in with a subject line of proud of my son. Dan, I love your podcast. I was turned on to it by my son roughly two years ago. He saw me in Milwaukee and raved about the show. I binged all the episodes and wait every Monday for the next one. My son turns 22 on April 2nd. I'm so proud of this young man. He's kind, caring. He's on the right path in his business career. My birthday started out with my wife calling me on April Fool's Day. and uh, Or his birthday, excuse me. His birthday started out with my wife calling me on April Fool's Day and told me she was going to be induced for labor, labor because of her blood pressure being elevated. I was at work at the time and told her I'm busy. Quit joking around. Ha ha, April Fool's. And I hung up on her. She called back crying. Not a joke. Uh, (laughs) I don't want to have an April Fool's Day, baby. We rushed to the hospital and she fought him off until uh, until that night. He was born April 2nd, uh, 2002 at 2.22 a.m. And he's 22 this year. Oh, that's awesome. If you could shout out uh, happy birthday to Peyton uh, from his proud father, he would get a kick out of it. Of course, I give the show three out of five stars because it continues sucking. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Rich. And, And sorry this is a bit late, but happy birthday, Peyton. You share the same birthday as my dad, actually. April 2nd, uh, he turned 70 this year. Uh, not sure if he's still killing, but he's still capable. He's doing great health-wise. Still strong. Still got a certain look in his eye. Uh, thanks for uh, turning your dad onto the show, and I'm so glad the two of you can enjoy it together. Uh, I love seeing grown kids and their parents finding common ground and enjoying life together. It's very special. Uh, if you have it, treasure it. And let's keep the family theme going with another fine family message from Lane Lewis, who writes in with the subject line of, you finally got me. I'm in Cummins Laud. Let's see how this fine sack bonded with the fam over that now. Lane writes, Greetings, Suck Master and all the Bad Magic crew. I'm writing in to share my Cummins Law story, but unlike most people, I was actually Cummins Law by your stand-up. I was driving home and listening to your Get Out of Here Devil album, and I pulled into my driveway and turned my car off. Several hours later, my family piles in my sister's car to go eat dinner, and my phone connects automatically before my sister can connect hers, and she shrugs it off. As we go to pull out of the driveway, you belt out over the radio, let's talk about hard dick, father, son, stop. (laughs) <laughs> my sister puts the car in park and just looks at me and says what the fuck was that both my parents look horrified I just shrug and say you wouldn't get it and now for obvious reasons I've lost phone privileges in other people's cars sorry for the long email love the show keep it up Lane Lewis Lane Lewis you sound like a superhero maybe I think of Lois Lane Lane Lewis uh, Lane what a beautiful moment I hope your dad is very nervous about how you want to connect with him now I hope it keeps him up at night wondering where he went wrong with you <laughs> for real though uh, I like that you uh, were all heading off as a family to do something together now even more family love from brother lover but not that way and sweet sack I don't think and sweet sack Elizabeth Cruz who wrote in the subject line of God is in the fourth dimension she starts with okay hear me out if we follow the theory that the existence of a higher dimension means a lower dimension cannot exist except in the mind of another being then in your own words that means we should only exist in the mind of a fourth dimensional being does that not lend credence to God I swear I'm not crazy. I wholly believe both science and religion can coexist. As someone with a degree in religious studies, one of my professors, who also happened to be a Lutheran pastor, said it best, science and religion are not in competition because they are asking different questions. 
Science asks what and how, while religion asks who and why. So if according to the Bible, God is all-knowing and all around us, then the only explanation is that we are just figments of a fourth-dimensional being's mind, much like the characters in a story all known by the author who wrote it. This would also explain why experiences of God by actual prophets only appear in dreams or visions as they are the only time we would be able to break out of our forced perception of the third dimension or like a character in a D&D game rolling for a perception with a natural 20 and getting a glimpse of the game board instead. This would also allow for people to have their own religious experiences and practices because who can say there's only one being in the fourth dimension? Maybe your God is there too. Maybe I'm rambling. Maybe I sound like a loon. Maybe you'll get it. P.S. A good trip on Toad Venom sounds like a successful perception check to me. Three out of five stars. That's some good shit. Elizabeth. Also, if you read the shout out to the best brother in the world, Adam West. No, not that Adam West, who would be Batman, but still a badass. Elizabeth, uh, love that you love your brother enough to think he's the best in the world. That is awesome. Uh, Also love the thought that we could all exist in the mind of some higher creator and that perhaps even multiple higher powers exist. Some kind of creative force of other beings and that different people have caught different glimpses of, you know, different entities. You know what I really love about pondering the possibilities of a higher power or higher powers? The magical mystery of it all. The mystique it adds to lives that can feel a bit like wash, rinse, and repeat sometimes, right? Be born, struggle, love and hate, succeed and fail, then die. Hard stop for you, uh, but repeated endlessly for billions like you with no ultimate purpose other than to enjoy what time we have here, which is still a lot. I am thankful if we just have this life, but sure is fun to speculate about what may uh, else be out there. That's why I love topics like the fourth dimension episode. And the final one today relates to a friend. Smart Sack John Rand sent this message with my way with the subject line of a very trippy episode. He writes, hello, Dan, Lindsay, all your glorious Meat Sack staff. Listen to the psychedelics episode. Loved it like I do most of them. Had to ask a question in regards to the material or maybe a little missing material. I know Dan is or was friends with Shane Moss from way back. There's a part in the episode where you mentioned MAO inhibitors. And I thought that might be a segue into mentioning Shane in his documentary called Psychonautics a comics exploration of psychedelics, uh, which is available on Amazon Prime. After the episode had wrapped, I was a little bummed that one of the most foremost experts on tripping balls didn't get a mention. Shane and his tales of synchronicity are something else. Yes. Maybe the Jason character Dan had to break his mind uh, at the Tool concert, uh, trying to distance himself from being considered the foremost expert. No, it wasn't Shane there. Uh, Anyway, I mentioned Shane because I'm concerned about him. About a year ago, he disappeared from all of the content creations on platforms I followed him on. Since he's a known manic, I worry that he's having one of his episodes, uh, hoping he's not back in the psych ward or worse, uh, not one of his own choosing. If you can't talk about his exploits on air, I understand. Keep up the good work. Thanks for doing what you do. Three out of stars. Three out of five stars wouldn't change a thing. Excuse me. Sincerely, Meat Sack John Rance. John, so glad you brought up Shane. Uh, And I I definitely should have mentioned, he is fine. Yeah, uh, he's doing great. Uh, We're still friends. We talked several times this past year. The doc on Amazon, uh, I've watched it. It's phenomenal. Uh, While he and I have not tripped together, we've definitely had more of what I would call like academic discussions about psychedelics. And yeah, no, he's doing, he's doing very good. He's very healthy. He's, uh, seems very happy. He's touring right now uh, with a show about psychedelics called A Better Trip. Uh, He just, uh, he worked out the performance in Las Vegas first and had a little residency there. Uh, He was just at South by Southwest in Austin a few weeks ago. He's been taking this uh, all over the place. He he is brilliant, truly a brilliant man. Uh, Shane Moss, it's M-A-U-S-S. S-H-A-N-E, M-A-U-S-S dot com. You can check out his tour. He's going to be all over in April, uh, May, June in America, uh, in Canada, Portland, Sacramento, Beverly Hills, Santa Cruz, Tacoma, Boise, all over British Columbia. Lucky bastard. Um, If you see a show and you you talk to him, tell him I said hi. If you're just someone listening, you're curious to learn more about psychedelics, he knows a lot more than I do, uh, both from the experiential side and the research side. Yeah, he is a very, very interesting dude. Tell him I I sent you if you do say hi. And that is all for today. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thank you for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Scared to death and time suck each week. Uh, Short sucks, nightmare fuel on uh, the time suck and scared to death feeds some weeks. Trying for twice a month on each of those. Please don't try and start a race war this week. Uh, it won't happen. And it doesn't make any sense. Just, I don't know, just beat off or something instead. Maybe you're angry because you're horny or something. Wor- worst, worst case, when you're done beating off, you know, maybe you're still angry, but you've also had some fun. I don't know. Just, uh, just keep on sucking. Bad magic.
Logic Productions. And uh, last thing, anyone else still really disturbed thinking about Dick Bird? Whew. I've, uh, that guy's messed me up a little bit. I've had trouble sleeping at night since I learned about that demented pile of shit. If you still haven't heard that true crime episode about that serial killer, make sure you listen to it next. And listen to the whole thing. I saved the worst for last on that one, but, but you're going to want to tough it out and make it to the end. I mean, Joseph Paul Franklin was disgusting, but uh, still not Richard Bird. I will, I will never think of Nevada the same way again. Ugh. <laughs>